We can't hear you, Nathan. Can you hear? Me? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. I think uh, host got muted. Everyone. So, uh, good morning and good evening to everyone from all parts of the world who have registered for the great event. Uh, hope you and your family are doing safe in this COVID times. Our best wishes are with all of you. Uh, the half-day virtual event, which is happening today, is a very interesting topic. And we'll focus on how emerging technologies like AI, machine learning, 5G, and IoT is changing the landscape of cybersecurity sector. Along with the talks, we have a couple of great panel discussions too, which will add a flavor and will bring you a deep insight into the technology. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. So my name is Nitin Naveen and I'm the Vice President Innovation Strategy at AI Core Spot. I'll be your host for the day. Further, I've been joined by my colleague, uh, Naveen is there, Arvind is there, who will assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving some technical glitches which keeps on happening sometimes in between. So thanks a lot uh, to them for putting in hard work and uh, making this event a great success and bringing you all together. We'll try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that uh, you can gain maximum output out of the event. Uh, from AI Code Spot front, I'll give you an insight how we started. So we started this year, early this year, and we are gaining momentum as the time is tickling on. Uh, our aim is to obviously be the number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you all can be a part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a success. We'll continue to do industry-backed events, webinars, hybrid events, and obviously the knowledge repository will be made from reliable data through the thought leaders like you all, like the speakers is there. We have subject matter experts. We have industry thought leaders who will be assisting us in this whole process. We'll enrich the content through uh, the digital content, the newsletters, which we are publishing on a regular basis, podcasts for which we'll approach all the great speakers, blogs, videos, and whatever we can to shed light on this ever evolving industry. Our mission, obviously, is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies, which is not limited to one technology, but yeah, it comprises of all like AI, ML, deep learning, robotics, blockchain, IoT, edge computing, 5G, drone, edge AI, twin, uh, uh, digital twins, AR, VR, cloud, and so on. Request all of you to go through our website, that is aicoresport.io, for further updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months. Uh, today's event is one series of events which we have planned for this month. It's power packed with speakers' presentations and panel discussions, as I told you initially. It's themed around how AI is transforming cybersecurity sector. There are lots more in store for subsequent months as well, with focus on telecom, IoT, blockchain, healthcare, retail, e including financial sector. So I request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the evening. Before starting with the day, I would like to highlight a few things. You can set up the tone for the day and uh, it will give you an amazing learning and networking experience. Special mention to our technology partner, Digit7, who has helped us in achieving our vision and objectives. Uh, they support us in creating this platform through which we can help achieve all what we can today. Uh, their support is immense and we are there because of them. So some introduction about Digit7 to everyone who have uh, started to attend this event. Innovation is obviously the cornerstone of Digit7. They are filled with uh, great direction and purpose is what they are providing with the structure. The visionaries at Digit7 are realized this a quarter of a century ago and they have ever since provided organizations with the strategic roadmap, innovation more roadmap they need to forego their futures. Innovation is their last name and disruption is their address. They created paradigm shifts in organizations, lots of organizations for which they are having a client with intuitive technologies, equipping firms to endure accelerating change. Uh, some of their products are Smart Express Store, e-commerce, grab and go, edge POS, admin store management, smart AR, delivery pickup app, digital wallet, drone scan, 
blockchain based SCM, label monkey, data mink, and digital twins. Uh, the services which they offer are the priority is obviously innovation as a service. Second is product engineering, then digital transformation, custom experience, and innovation design. So you all can go through the website that is digit7.io and understand more in depth about them. Also, I'd like to thank all our community partners for today, which includes InfoVision, Casera, Alert Logic, Cisco, Cisco Research, Cogniz, 1898 and Co., Intel, International INC, RMS, Customers Bank, CIA Cybersecurity, Tenable, and Empire's community to make this event a huge success. Special mention to all the speakers uh, who are there and attendees of the event who have registered for this and came today to achieve their objectives through this forum. So if you, uh, if you want to ask any questions, you can type in the Q&A section, which is there on the right side of the menu option. You can type in as when as any speaker speaks for the day. Don't wait for the speaker talk to end. You can type in and we'll try to get it answered after each talk or as per the time permitted between the talk as well. There's also a hand button at the bottom of the screen through which you can even raise the hand and come to the stage to ask questions to speakers as well. Now, let's begin the show. So before beginning, I would like to take you all through the agenda for the day so that it gives you an insight about the timing and who all are the speakers for the day. Uh, easy for you to understand. Let me share the screen. Hope the screen is visible to every one of you. So yeah, so I'll just take you through the agenda. This is a self-explanatory agenda and all of you must have seen this, but yeah, I'll let you all know. So yeah, we are starting at 8.40 a.m. just now. We have Ferris, who is the first speaker for the day. His topic is in front of you. He's the VP of Cybersecurity, Casera. Then we have Rohit Dhamkar, who is VP Alert Logic. Then we have Chris, who is the principal engineer, Cisco. Then we have a panel discussion for which Chitray Mani is the Chief Technology Innovation Officer, InfoVision. He's the moderator. We have Sachin, who is CEO and CTO, Sine Cogniz. Ali Elami is there, who is Director of Industrial Cybersecurity, 1898 and Co. We have Charles Dembrele, who is Chief Risk Officer, Intel International INC. So we, all these four are for the speaker, for the panel discussion. Then we have Ali again, who will be taking a separate talk on cybersecurity resiliency in the industrial sector. Then we have Sachin, who is the CTO of Armis. Then we have Ashish, who is head of cybersecurity research, Cisco Research. Then we have Andre, who is EVP, Chief Information Security Officer, Customers Bank. And then we have another panel discussion before we end the day. So it will be, I think, great one. We have Rex Johnson, who is director of CI Cybersecurity. We have Nathan who is Chief Security Strategist at Tenable. We have Sandeep Grover, who is the VP Information Technology at Empire Communities. So yeah, we have two great panel discussion and we have lovely talks for the day. So yeah, so we'll move on to our first presenter for the day, Ferris, over to you. Hope you all guys will have a great time with, her, with all of those speakers. Thank you. Uh, Ferris, you can yeah share the screen and then okay. you can start. I hope everybody can see my screen. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me. And I'm going to be the first speaker to you to talk about uh, 5G and IoT. And because of the time, you know, usually this presentation, I spend more than 60 minutes to talk about it because there is a lot of, you know, aspect to this conversation. But um, I'm going to try to squeeze it to 20 minutes. So this is the topic that we're going to talk about it today. Uh, this is me, my company, Castro Cybersecurity and Beyond. I'm the Vice President of Cybersecurity and Compliance. And we're going to, because of the time, I'm not going to uh, spend time to talk about myself. You can uh, follow me or join me on LinkedIn and we can have uh, you know, any discussion about 5G and IoT. So let's start with the technical aspect now of 5G overview and the first slide. I'm going to present to you talks about mobile wireless communication history. As you can see here in the timeline, 
we started, you know, from the 1G from uh, the 80s, and now we are in the 2020, and you see, you know, the how we started from the voice calls, analog nine years, then we went to the texting, then with the emails, and now with the 4G that, that we have, and then the promise with the 5G, with one gigabyte, with the IoT, smart cities. So the first generation of the wireless network, the 1G, brought us as a consumers, you know, the analog voice calls. Then with 2Gs, we have the privilege to do SMS. Then with 3G, we start doing web browsing and high-speed data and video streaming with 4G. Now, 5G networks, as you know, they're going to use what everybody in, in the telecom industry understand, the 3 GPP, the base cellular systems, and it's going to be an evolution from the 4G and uniquely, 5G can operate across low, mid, and high band spectrums. So early generations use only the low band spectrum only, and uh, the high band offers that 5G will use the fastest speed and has distance and building penetration, uh, you know, uh, ob- ob- you know, advantages with five with 4Gs. That 4Gs they cannot really do that penetrations for the buildings. Now let's talk about the promise of 5G. And before I do that, I need I need to explain to you about the basic idea of 5G. 5G is a complete ecosystem that involves three key components. I call them the three pillars of 5G. So the first one is the chipsets, where such as Qualcomm, the companies that they provide those chipsets. Uh, Qualcomm, I'm I'm sure you heard about those companies, Intel, Samsung, and the Snapdragon 855. Now, the, uh, the chipset, what I mean by that, it means the processor and the modem. And then beside the chipset, we need the devices, the devices that we use today, Samsung iPhones. Those are mobile phones. They could be routers or IoT sensors. And the device support depend on the type of the chipset. Also, we have the mobile network, which is have now the new radio sites that support 5G along with the 5G core. So to have 5G service, we need to have both compatible devices and network. Now, as you can see in your screen, what 5G they are capable today when we have 5G as a full deployment, it's going to handle a high throughput up to 10 gigabytes. We're going to have a large bandwidth. So the LTE usually has uh, 20 megahertz and the 5G will have 100 megahertz on the 3.5 gigahertz range. Of, of course, we're going to have low, uh, low energy consumption with up to 10-year battery life for the machine-to-machine communications. 5G will cater for more devices per kilometers, up to 1 million, to support the massive IoT requirement. Uh, with ultra latency, with 5G, the lag between sending a request to the network, resp- uh, to the network uh, sending a request and the network responding to that request will drop to one millisecond, which is means 400 times faster than the blink of an eye. 5G will help us to g- get a strong signal in the crowded areas, as I mentioned. Uh, if we go to the next slide, so this is what we have today about the enhanced mobile broadband. And this slide I wanted to give you today what we have from the latency, from the availability, from the rate, and what we're going to have with the massive IoT that 5G will help and you know massive IoT will need for sure the ultra reliable low latency. So it's important to note that 5G new radio deployments will focus on the enhanced mobile broadband, the use cases to boost the capacity to provide an elevated broadband with experience, which is the extreme throughput, the faster speed and lower latencies. So from devices powering smart cities, autonomous vehicles, our roads, and our smart homes, hardware, of course, the mobile handsets, which means 10 of million, billion of devices will be connected in 5G. So what you can see here, the differences between what we have now and what we're going to have with the massive IoT, that, you know, give us an idea that 5G potentially, it's a revolution. It's going to be an enabler, and, energ- and it's going to energize for a wide range of coming changes that they can rock the way we are people we live and we do business. It's going to be aligned with autonomy, embraced by artificial intelligence, supported by big data, enabling also greater uh, mobility and promoting technologies 
such as, as I, as I mentioned, the autonomous vehicles, the robotics, smart homes, and hospitals. Now with 5G, there's something important uh, we're gonna enjoy, and I think this is one of their advantages. I'm sure some of you might hear about it, which is the network slicing. So network slicing is one of these technologies that will enable a greater degree of security for the 5G network. So I'm gonna quote uh, somebody from Nokia, which is Sandro Travers. He is the head of mobile networks. He said, you have ways basically to segregate the traffic when you have a network slicing. If a threat is located in one slice, you, it's not going to go to the other slices. And one of the areas to achieve slicing is virtualizations. So 5G is built on the virtualizations and on the cloud. So the whole idea about 5G is transformation, is slicing as a service. What do I mean by slicing here? I mean efficiency. So both private networks and network slicing can allow the businesses to get a different levels of connectivity from their source provider to accommodate multiple use cases for the IoT. And I have to mention also that the network slicing is a type of a virtual networking ar architectures. It's the same family we are familiar with, software-defined networking and networking functions virtualizations. Those two are closely related to the network virtualization technologies. Now they are moving a lot, moving now. And uh, as I mentioned, the network slicing will permit the logical separation of networks. So each slice will provide a unique connectivity. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, or no, we should not forget that all those slices will run on the same infrastructure. Now, a network slice that's used by the healthcare segment, you know, to communicate information about patient information requires more security than a network slice that's being used by a gaming company to provide an access. Also, it's important to mention when I talk about uh, slicing, we have also to talk about the edge computing because edge computing now, it's coming along with the 5G. And what, what do I mean by edge computing? It's a distributed computing that brings the computer's data storage closer to the location where we need it. And the computation is largely or completely performed on a distributed de device nodes. Now the edge here, we refer to having uh, the computing infrastructure closer to the source of data. So this infrastructure mm -hmm. will require effective use of resources that may not be continuously connected to the network. So we're gonna use them offline, such as laptops, smartphones, tablets, and sensor. So the 5G will uh, facilitate the edge computing, which can, as I said, take takes computing away from the core of the network and place it near the source of the data. So edge computing, it's coming up with this ideology of bringing, as I said, again, the compute storage networking closer to the consumer. And edge computing, as an example, mobile devices, smart cities, smart homes, and smart street lights. Now, one of the things, because security is important all the time when we talk about this, security at the edge here is going to be all the time remain a challenge because there are highly diverse use cases for IoT, and most of those IoT devices do not have the traditional IT hardware protocols. So the security configurations, the software updates, which are often needed through the life cycle of the device may not be present. Uh, I wanted to hear something to mention to you about there are current key standards published that covers IoT from a security perspective. Uh, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, the NIST, they have set of basic IoT security practices for manufacture. It was released in the 2020. Also, the European Union Ag uh, Agency for Cyber Security, also they you know, issue a baseline recommendations for IoT security. And also in the state, uh, in California, the portion of the California Civil Code also mandate the security of IoT devices. And give you just you know, a high, an idea about the NIST, especially, uh, you know, they have a good best practices for IoT devices for the manufacturers. Their recommendation start, as you can see in your screen, by identify, doing research, determine, plan, define, and decide. So I think th those steps are, you know, quite important and, I, you know, from that coming from the NIST that help to bring more uh, security and privacy for those IoT, for the IoT devices and those recommendations 
goes to the manufacturers. <clears throat> now quickly, let's uh, check some uh, two use cases here. So with, I, with 5G and IoT, we're going to have, it's going to enable the 5G, enable new mission critical control services. So as you can see here, we have the autonomous vehicles, the industrial automations, which can provide high reliability. We have robotics, aviation, which is they need an ultra low latency. Also, we have the energy smart grid, medical, that needs a high availability. So 5G speeds and other benefits like low latency make the 5G technology well suited to support those IoT connected devices and applications. And the 5G can provide the bandwidth, the low latency, and even the power management to assess IoT devices to perform better and longer. Also, the carriers will be able to offer a private networks and or a similar service through the network slicing. Now, something to mention here when I talk about the autonomous vehicles, again, I go back to security. We have, you know, and over the past uh, few months, we, you know, we come across security vulnerabilities in the complex supply chain, especially for the autonomous vehicles. Because as you know, the automated manufacturer, they rely heavily upon the third party vendors to, prov to provide, to supply the systems, the software, and the hard component to, the, to those vehicles. However, unless those auto manufacturers mm -hmm. impose a rigorous cybersecurity requirement on their tier one and tier two suppliers, we're gonna run into the risk of introducing cyber uh, security vulnerabilities via these components. Uh, this is another example uh, of a business case for the, uh, for the truck platooning. And as you can see uh, in this figure, it says in, in many countries, they have road clogged with traffic and creating jams. It's frustrating, uh, you know, so we have this, you know, example that it's gonna help or when uh, several trucks travel in a tightly knit, automatically controlled convoy behind a lead human uh, driven vehicle promises not only to, uh, you know, to introduce this congestion, but it will lower the fuel consumption and also to cut transport costs for logistic companies. Now let's talk about the business implications for from a privacy and security, especially our focus here on the IoT. So what I can tell you today that currently the IoT devices, they contribute for a 16% of the traffic, but account for 78% of the malware on the mobile network. And many of those IoT devices, they suffer from a real problem especially when they don't receive frequent updates so they can address security issues to protect them for the vulnerabilities. So IT devices also, they become at home potential gateway for hackers. With that existing vulnerabilities, when we have poor configuration and the use of default password, they are among the factors they can aid a hacker in comprising at least one device and a smart home system. So if you can see here, the, the problem with IoT that we still have lack of standard for IoT uh, device security. Security is impacted through the scale. Sp uh, uh, security is not by design, it's after it's built on. Uh, devices might require complex authentication process. IoT devices, they are not secure by design and they become an entry point for a DDoS attack. From a privacy, because we have a sensors, we have, we're gonna have billions of devices collecting data. So we're going to have an issue of evolving the definition of data, how we define data. We're going to have something we're going to believe the big data because we're going to have a large volumes of data. We're going to have an issue with the data ethics, data localizations, how to identify the single source of truth. And uh, as a con consumers, we're going to have also to have the issue with the consent and access right, because I might give my consent for one data to be collected, but because they are different data, they might be correlated together and used in a different way that I did not give my consent and access rights. And I think now some of the, like in Europe, the GDPR, they're trying to address those beside the CCPA. And here also in Canada, we are trying to do the same with the PPDA with the new bills introduced through the parliament. Now, beyond compliance, how we can go from good to great, you know, beside those security challenges that I mentioned quickly, so I can say that good, uh, good cyber security hygiene for such devices for IoT, they start with ensure default admin credentials are changed or shutting down a traffic on a non-essential network ports are often needed 
for those common IoT attacks. Also, 5G will require better mechanism for accountability, data minimizations, transparency, openness, and access control. So to, through the standardization of 5G, strong privacy regulations and legislation should also be considered. So as you can see here, we need privacy by design. We need security by design. We need uh, very complex authentication to avoid those uh, attacks like the DDoS attacks. We need to have standards to build IoT devices. We should not overlook the fact about the insider threats and the legacy systems because an inadvertent insider, they, may, they might leave the organization open uh, to attack by falling for phishing scams or social engineering and through the improper configurations of systems, servers, and cloud environment and, and by foregoing password best practices. Also the legacy system that, you know, in most big organization, it's there protecting those uh, legacy system. It's very important because they might become, you know, the, the gateway or the entry for those hackers. Uh, the last thing I want to say, I think when security becomes very complex, but in my opinion, we should increase our attentions to the fundamentals, mean we should focus as security people uh, working on the core responsibilities, meaning I should know my assets, my inventory, understanding my firm's vulnerabilities and my attack servers, uh, service, sorry, classifying sensitive data and understand the tracking usage patterns. Also, it's very important to use defense and depth, multi-level authentications and layer defenses to ensure device security, to improve patch management and more. Thank you so much. I know that was a, a quick overview about 5G. I hope I added something to your knowledge about 5G. Thank you, Ferris. Thank you. And it was a great session with some used cases. Thanks for all the uh, insight into the cybersecurity. Thank you. Thank you. So the guys who have joined late, uh, just to let all, you all know that uh, if you want to ask questions to the speakers, you can type in the Q&A section as and when they speak so that we can get it answered after the end of the session. It's important as we have a lot of speakers for the day. Okay. So just to give you an insight. So now we'll quickly move on to our next speaker. Uh, Rohit is there. Rohit is Namankar, who is a VP tech for, uh, from Alert Logic, and his topic is why AI is there in cybersecurity. Over to you, Rohit. Thank you. Hi. Can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. We can see your screen. We can hear you. Uh, you can make the screen enlarged, uh, means uh, in the PowerPoint mode. Yeah, I think I'm already in the full screen mode, so you should be able okay. to see. Great. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Nitin. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the topic that I have chosen today is why is AI becoming so much more relevant in cybersecurity today? And uh, I want to walk you through multiple examples of what the detection game, that is, how do you track bad guys today with various technologies and how AI has become critical in doing that exact thing. So before I begin, um, I just want to say one thing that even though we know that you know, deep learning, machine learning are all subsets of AI, usually in cybersecurity industry today, AI and ML are almost used interchangeably. So I will do that as well. The other term, which uh, I might refer to as signals, these are anything that's interesting from a security perspective. Uh, so that's what I'm calling a signal uh, as I talk to. Now, before I get in as to where the AI becomes applicable, uh, the vehicles for application of AI are, of course, through various security products. And uh, although I have not represented all of them here, uh, if you go to any security conference like RSA, you probably have 500 plus vendors exhibiting their products there. But this is to just give you a quick overview of the very common things that most of the people are using in their environments today. So we began this journey on security products, uh, I think at 80s with the antivirus. Um, from host-based, um, there was an explosion of networking and so a lot of security focus around that through firewalls, the intrusion detection prevention systems, web app firewalls. 
And you have this phenomenon where we go back from host to network, back to host, depending on you know if the encryption increases, increases on the network side. So we went back to the HITS, which is the host-based intrusion detection systems. We went to file integrity monitoring. And then when all of these products started you know, issuing a lot of alerts, uh, then we said, okay, we need some management platform to you know, look at these events in aggregate and make sense out of them. And that's how seems were born. That's also how threat intelligence kind of got prominence to apply more intelligence to the data that was being gathered. And today we are in, in stage where most of the products are next gen. Uh, that's kind of the industry buzzword and you will see the next gen for firewalls, next gen for analytics, uh, EDR is the next gen for your AV. And so a lot of these products now have started using AI and a lot of environments today um, our experience comes mostly from a lot of the SMB, SME customers. People are moving to cloud. They are in the phase of journey where they have done some lift and shift from their data center environment straight into the cloud. Uh, people are still transitioning from the lift and shift in the cloud to going pure native environments in the cloud. And so as a result, uh, the the uh, attack surface has now expanded from whatever their data center was subjected to now to cloud. And uh, we do have some cloud security offerings coming straight from the cloud providers like AWS and Azure. So that's these are the range of products and all of these products right from the first generation to the next generation and the latest one today are used across various environments to do uh, both protection and detection. And these are the products that are using AI in various capacities, which we will look into. So before I move on to the AI, I also want to point to one fundamental thing. Hi, which is, yes. yes. Yeah. So yes. we cannot so, see the screen. Uh, uh, I mean, the screen is visible, but we cannot see the presentation that you are trying to speak. Yes. Yes. How about that? Yes. Yes. No, it is there. Yeah, we are able to see Okay, uh, I apologize for it. I was in full screen on PowerPoint. Uh, so if this works, I will speak to this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so all I was showing there was Can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, all I was doing was a little journey into how we have evolved in security technologies. Uh, the next thing that I would like to um, focus on here is the, the way these first generation, the next generation technologies are being used is you have constantly evolving breach vectors. And these come all the way from phishing to specific web application attacks to your ransomware, which is the most popular vector right now, to credential theft, um, attacking the browsers, and whatever the next uh, big vector will turn out to be. Uh, so in general, your assets, the attacks are going after, which everybody knows, is all the identities, the data, the various cloud and uh, various systems that you have in place, applications, right? The main thing to point out here is a lot of these first and second, the next generation prevention technologies are blocking, they, they produce blocking signals with high confidence, good severity that are, are used today to detect and block very many known attacks. Uh, these next generation technologies are using some part of AI. The first generation technologies are still in, if you think about in terms of the volume of attacks going on across the world, they are still your front facing technologies to really drop the bad guy's activity. And at the top, whatever bypasses these two, because in, in any environment, these technologies are configured to make sure the business is available, the availability of the business is at the helm. You don't want to stop these, you know, any kind of access to the business. Because of that, the way the configuration works is they block the signals with high confidence and severity, and then everything else is, is, is getting through these systems. And this is where these are all, whatever the signals that are not that high confidence, suspicious signals, which bypass these technologies, is what today cause most of the breaches. So when you hear the headlines and when you see somebody was breached, it's not because they didn't have a good layered approach in place. It's just that 
the business con con continuity and availability dominated the security and signals bypassed, and that's how the breaches happen. So in general, what also has been happening is all of these uh, technologies from the first generation, uh, even including the current generation technologies, they have typically used four methods of detecting bad guys. You all may have heard of rule and, rule and signature based things. This is where you write patterns into an idea. So you are identifying specific AV with hashes. Uh, and that's how you are saying something is bad. Uh, there are systems that are detecting like DDoS attacks or brute force attacks, which are now using aggregation across a bunch of signals to say, hey, something more sinister is happening if I look at these signals in aggregate. Then there are a lot of these log analytics systems that are using state tracking. So they're keeping how the user has come into the environment, what the user is doing now, and then tracking something bad going on. And the last thing is all of these systems um, on, and products, they provide facility where if none of these other three components work for detecting bad guys, that is, if rule-based, aggregation-based, and state tracking based is not sufficient, then there is a way to write an extent functionality with just code. And that's the status of a lot of these systems that have been there for the longest time in the last 15 years. And that's how the, the, the detection has worked. Now, what has kind of really undergone a major shift, right, is the entire cybercrime culture. And I uh, this is courtesy Kaspersky Labs that is tracking a lot of threat actors all the time. Uh, this is an endpoint AV company. So they look at all the malware, they look at all the campaigns. And what you can see on the screen is a distinct shift where even five years back, there was one leader who was basically orchestrating the entire threat campaign. So, so basically compromising systems, making people pay, giving people payouts to your affiliates. It was all rather centralized. If you go on the right and look at it, it looks almost like a corporation now with various leaders in various places and various functions, in fact, driven by certain motivations. Uh, and, and I'm sure if we probably they use something like an ADP for their paychecks and their paychecks probably are bigger than what we get. Uh, but the uh, alongside this evolution, there has always also been one constant theme. These guys are, are trying to evade any systems you put in place. So the traditional way of evading the security systems has been uh, you look at weaknesses in the implementation of protocols, you bypass with certain clever techniques these protocol implementations, or you really go and find the vulnerability in the security product itself in the way they process either the traffic or the file, and that's how you end up bypassing that security system. However, the, the major important trend that has been observed in the last many years is these attackers are just very trying very hard to blend in. And by blending in, it makes it very difficult to single them out. And many examples of blending in are things like fileless malware, where actually no file is dropped on the system to be examined. Uh, things happen out of memory. Or what in... Uh, the security world is called living offline binaries, where the hacker is not bringing in any new malicious file necessarily in the system. He's using whatever your Windows operating system offers in terms of commands and using those commands to the advantage to either propagate laterally in the environment or to do other things like dumping data, etc. But that is what is causing the blending in. It's almost like... Uh, uh, the parallel evolution of you know terrorism where all of these terrorist cells they want to blend in they want to blend in with the people wherever they are operating and it's exactly the same thing so this is it, it is has been a major shift in the last years uh, and that combined with the fact that you now have a huge amount of malware all of these crime actor syndicates are constantly you know pumping malware and if you think about it for a second um the, the stats tell you that just 2021, it's not over yet. There are more than a billion samples of malware today uh, in existence. And at, if you look at the statistics, even from the last few months, you have four new malware samples, which are being produced every second. Okay. And, and that's a huge increase. 
Uh, the same thing has happened in the world of vulnerabilities. Uh, we have here one of our distinguished speakers from Tenable, which actually this is their main focus of dealing with people's, you know, the, the, the rate of vulnerabilities, how many vulnerabilities exist in an environment and how do you really deal with it. But overall, the number has been increasing. Uh, you just heard from previous speaker about the, the IoT stuff. I have seen a recent rise in number of IoT vulnerabilities as well, uh, which uh, exist in a lot of different IoT products. And these numbers will definitely balloon as we go up. So there is a lot of, uh, in terms of the attackers trying to evade, the attackers trying to really make the life miserable. Like, I mean, think about if you are trying to detect malware with writing signatures, I mean, it's, it's an impossible job to produce them. So a lot of products and a lot of, you know, even services have seen these trends coming and have definitely gone and adopted uh, the machine learning paradigm here. And there have been, I would say, three broad classes of problems that today AI has been solving. Uh, one of them is discovering of anomalies, which is very directly related to the attackers trying to blend in. So when you are using the machine learning or techniques for anomalies, you do these techniques at various levels. Uh, the one of the very first layers is at the network level, layer, where if you are examining all the communications, you are trying to single out if some communication pattern across your environment looks very weird whether it is in terms of number of peer connections, the volume of traffic, the kind of protocols, and all of this is being learned and then anomalies being you know, figured out on top of that pattern. Same thing is also happening at higher level protocols like HTTP is the workhorse of the internet right now, whether it's APIs or all the web applications and people are building successful models for machine learning on top of HTTP and specific applications to see is the applications, be, are the applications behaving on certain requests very weirdly? Uh, are they sending more data suddenly? Um, is, is the request looking something abnormal? So all of that is being learned constantly through ML-based uh, techniques. Uh, the same thing happening uh, at various products on the host level side. So people are looking at if, for example, if the process invocation chain on the host looks weird, uh, a very easy example is, is your PowerPoint now suddenly calling your PowerShell on Windows to do something, which is a very abnormal thing for a PowerPoint to do in normal course. Uh, same thing with command line arguments. So if you're executing commands in the system and the command line arguments just look very weird, uh, it, 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 these, these models are raising that flag appropriately. Uh, it's also happening at the user level on an aggregate. Is this uh, is a specific user authenticating from places where he has never done in the past? Is he issuing commands, uh, including administrative commands, which he has never issued in, in the in the past? And is it this kind of user behavior is being applied across both cloud as well as the standard Active Directory environments uh, for Windows and also for in the Unix environments? So there is an entire bunch of people working on various. ML models to solve those three puzzles on the anomaly side. Another big chunk of work that is going in the AI and has gone in the AI for the last many years is classification problem. This is where you take in a new executable, a new DLL, uh, a PDF, and see if you can spot if the PDF or the DLL or if the executable is malicious. And this is done either through ML-based techniques, deep learning techniques. Uh, you can find a lot of uh, arguments in the industry one way or the other. But at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is solve this problem. It's those billion samples of, of your malware that's, that's being, and more samples being created, you know, literally every second. How do you classify them and automatically detect something that is bad? And the last thing that is, is being worked on from the ML AI side is more coming from a service-based industries where they are trying to train the models to, to replace human behavior. And uh, for the longest time, um, the PCI compliance, whoever is in the, whoever needs this PCI compliance, especially all the e-commerce vendors, um, the 
one of the requirements was saying somebody need to examine all the logs that are being generated from the systems on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of this analysis typically has been performed manually. People employ a host uh, of people to manually pour through these log lines and see if anything looks out of norm. And now all of those kind of tasks are being translated uh, to the ML models and uh, the ML replacing basically at least the first level human analysis. So again, uh, I'm not specifically pointing to any product. This, these developments have happened across the range of products that we have seen, whether they're on the host side, the network side, the analytics side. And so the question actually becomes saying, should we be in a great euphoria that aha, AI and ML has solved our security problems and we are actually winning the war against the bad guys? Uh, not so soon. What is also happening is, as I have seen you try to increase the number of AI ML related analytics or increase um, or apply various kinds of algorithms to detect more and more anomalies, you, you generate two types of signals. You generate signals that are good indicators of badness at a high confidence. And then you detect some things that are just suspicious, right? So you can't really take an action suspicious signals. Uh, and they increase actually at a rate that's much faster than the surety of just signals that you can automatically block. So you now have these AI ML systems now uh, are generating a lot of signals. It's great for false negatives, which is it's great that you will not miss a breach probably in the environment with these signals. But what it also means is you need a lot more expertise to hunt on these suspicious signals. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the battle on, on generating, doing more through AI for cybersecurity and getting more of these signals. And a lot of people, of course, rely on their SOCs. The enterprises have SOCs. Big banks have their own SOCs. Um, a lot of the SMB, SME market relies on other providers to give them these services. But what also exacerbates this problem is we already have a talent gap in cybersecurity. Uh, there are a few of my um, speakers on this uh, list today who are teaching cybersecurity courses. And that trend also has started in the last 10 years. A lot of people have gotten certifications through SANS and other organizations, but there is already an existing gap. Now we are actually rapidly evolving to cloud and uh, you sort of literally blink an eyelid and Amazon will have a new service next, you know, in another four months, in a sense. Uh, and you have a lot of people using a range of SaaS products. I mean, the average number is 100 plus for bigger enterprises that use various SaaS things. Now, all of these SaaS products come up with their own configuration. They have their own data. They have their own security requirements. So as a result, you don't have already a lot of people, you're evolving your attack surface at a very high rate. And that's why when you see statistics like a lot of companies are finding a, a steep shortage of people uh, from whether from the cloud side, whether from the retention part, uh, just attracting the talent and retaining them. Uh, a lot of people are affected today in this, in this, especially in the cybersecurity world. So where I think is, so right now we are in some sense um, if you think about the Gartner hype cycle for any technology, we are in the, in the cycle where we are thinking that AI ML is going to really solve everything, all of our problems. Uh, I'm just also pointing to some places where we can have our disillusionment. And this is one area where I see there could be some disillusionment if we do not deal with this as an industry. Uh, so, so if you see on the left side, you still need a lot of the AI ML subsystems, right? which across various products that are continuing to provide these wide variety of suspicious signals. That is a must. And as attackers constantly evolve, there are already papers and conference talks, in fact, on how to evade ML learning models. So how, how, when, how does your next malware evade an ML model if you have put in place for detecting malware through ML? It's, that is already happening. So there has to be constant vigilance and there has to be constant improvement in the way AI ML deals with these products to um, reduce any false negatives. On the other side, that's very much needed, which is 
I would say in infancy today, and it's not completely uh, built out in many products is you need to combine these signals. You need to have a good environment knowledge and the context. You also need to have a good business context in terms of, okay, what is the risk tolerance of the customer? And all of this needs to be combined to produce something that is very finite uh, in terms of uh, the number of composite alerts that come out of, of these systems. So that is needed because then you can have your SOC without having to in-depth knowledge of, you know, 1500 products. Uh, you, you can have a SOC that is, you know, laser focused based on your risk paradigm. And you are still doing a bunch of threat hunting on top of whatever you can actively eliminate from the environment. So that's what is needed as we move um, towards more AI in cybersecurity and uh, uh, using it more effectively, actually, uh, in a practical way. So the two things that uh, I would like to take away is, is AI ML has already arrived. It's already a part of many products that are using good algorithms at various levels. Uh, but our future of, of, of the success for AI and the hype that we have today, it will depend on how we are able to deal with all the extra signals that AI ML will definitely give us, but at the same time, balancing it out with another AI ML system that uh, you know, adjusts it based on environmental risk, uh, the, the kind of environment, and uh, the kind of uh, people that are available in the environment for dealing with them. So, so hopefully uh, you have a, a good overview of uh, the technologies that are used today in security for doing your prevention detection, the elements that go in making of these technologies and how AI is influencing them and what we need to watch out in future from the AI perspective across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit, for a lovely presentation, giving a lovely insight on the same. <laughs> so there are a few questions for you, Rohit. Uh, I know okay. time is up, but I want to take these questions because questions keep up the tempo for the day. So we have Alexis who have asked the question, what is the main advantage regarding classic cybersecurity? First question. You can uh, make it fast, uh, Rohit, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what the classic meant is, but if he's meaning that, okay, what is the main advantage of the first generation security products, it's... Uh, which do not use AI, uh, there are still a number of things that they can detect. They continue to be used. And it also depends on how much money people can spend. A lot of people cannot just upgrade their entire environment to go second generation today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Daniel. AI requires use of IoT for collecting data. Does adding IoT for AI increase the attack surface? <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't call it will increase the attack surface. I would say that uh, depending on what kind of AI is applied to the IoT, you might get the same thing where you produce a lot of suspicious signals that somebody needs to look at and examine for further use and value. Yeah. Uh, this last question from Nitin Deshpande. Is there a use case which will predict what class of assets will be attacked in the next one week or two weeks using historical data? Uh, I would say people have built uh, successful models from two angles. People have built models from actually taking the vulnerability data at the, at the moment that things are that are not patched, looked at the attacks that have been detected by various systems in the environment, and tried to build these predictive models. But one thing that uh, I can, based on my experience, I can say is these days things are happening so fast, uh, like as soon as a new vulnerability is announced, you have people scanning for it like that, that day or sometimes even zero days. They have been scanning already for it. And in many of those cases, by the time your prediction model, which, which could be a long-term model that you're applying, uh, comes into the picture, you probably would have already been attacked and potentially compromised if you are not acting fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit, for uh, answering the question. I think the audience questions are answered. Thank you for the same. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit, for a lovely presentation. Now we'll quickly move on to Chris. Chris, over to you. Uh, Chris, is, Chris is from Cisco, and his topic is obviously it's how AI and cybersecurity go hand to hand. Over to you, Chris. 
Thank you very much, Nitin. Uh, can you see my screen? No. Okay. Let's see, maybe. Yeah, I can see now. So, guys, okay. uh, there's one thing from my side. Uh, keep on typing in the questions if you have any questions as and when the Chris flow is there so that we can get it answered at the last. Yeah, Chris, over to you. Great, thank you. Today I'll talk to you about um, artificial intelligence machine learning in general and then how it becomes an interesting area for vulnerabilities in the enterprise. And then uh, finally I'll summarize by how we, how we can apply machine learning to improve cybersecurity. So the overall point, as, as uh, others have said so far, AIML is often used together in the same term, but they really do mean different things. Artificial intelligence is the general artificial intelligence imitating intelligent human behavior. And that's not really there yet today in, in all forms. Machine learning is more about training the, uh, an algorithm to, to learn and predict in improving on its own performance like humans do. So machine learning is where we see most of the prevalent work going on right now in AIML, uh, but I'll refer them jointly together. Just, just, just a good background. Uh, the reason we're talking about cybersecurity and artificial intelligence is because cybersecurity has changed the domain of software development in, in, in artificial intelligence. If we look at classical computing, it's deterministic, it's well-structured, predictable, explainable. But artificial intelligence machine learning is really uh, a different form of software development where it's probabilistic. It finds structure where humans cannot. It can predict events that humans cannot predict. And finally, it can actually develop answers to, to problems that we really can't interpret well in many cases, especially with deep neural networks. So it has the ability to, to find answers, but we can't explain why in some cases. It also has the ability to, to discover things that we can't discover on our own through uh, our application of, of machine learning. So let, let's step back and look at how machine learning is developed. And we'll, we'll talk about the attacks at different phases. So first of all, there's a training phase of machine learning, and many of you probably already know this, but I'll begin with this so we all have a level setting understanding. The, the beginning is we take data f uh, from the real world, apply it to a model, teach the model about the data, and sometimes it's supervised, which means it's the model is told what a, an input is and classified properly. Sometimes it's unsupervised, where it's just fed tons of data and it tries to find its own analysis. But then there is the result is we have a trained model from that work. Then they take that trained model and validate it and test it, and we deploy it into the real world during the inference phase. So during inference is when the model is deployed in, in the real world. Now, the, the reason we have different considerations in cybersecurity for machine learning is because there are, there are opportunities for poisoning this machine learning model. If attackers or even unwitting developers happen to apply a data set to their model that is not quite representative of the, of the population that they're going after, or that may be poisoned with intentional manipulation, that model has been corrupted as it's trained. And if that data is not detected early on, if that bad data is not detected, the model is deployed as a corrupted model, and it's able to be exploited by attackers, knowing this fact the model has been trained improperly. So that's the first phase of, of vulnerability for machine learning models. The second phase is evasion, impersonation, and inversion attacks during deployment. So these are after the model is deployed and trained and in, in production. There are still things that the model can suffer from if it's not well managed and carefully controlled by uh, inverting the model so that an attacker can actually learn the model itself and rebuild their own model based on your model in production. You can identify an individual uh, individual in the model data set that was used for training, which is a privacy attack in inversion attacks as well. And impersonation allows you to evade detection. So this is basically what we would do to protect the model in cybersecurity. We, we sanitize the data to protect it from attacks and manipulation of the data. We develop a robust model that's able to, to recover from data errors. And in performance evaluation, we assess its security. And then finally, in inference, there are privacy preserving techniques uh, so, so that we would use in normal software development um, to protect against privacy attacks of the model to infer members of populations.
So this is a, a broad overview. I'd like to dig into a couple examples, first of all, in more detail. First, a deep neural network backdoor attack. This is becoming... Yes? Uh, are you changing your slides? Oh, yes, I am. I am. Oh, we are not seeing you, this. You couldn't see that? No. Okay. Sorry. Very, very sorry. Um, can you see that now? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Can you see it now? I don't think we're okay. seeing the full slides. You can see them now? We see the overview of machine learning at this point. Good, that's good. So this was the model I was walking through and you couldn't see. I was doing a diligent job of keeping up with it well. I'm sorry about that. But this is, this is the machine learning model doing training and testing and the different attacks and the different defenses we can do against the model. That's what I was trying to describe in my description. Now we're moving into, did that slide change in that case? Nope. Do you see the new, new slide? No. No. Interesting. How about now? Yes. Okay, good to know. So the, the um, deep neural network backdoor attack. In this case, what we have is an intentional attack on a data pool, which puts a trigger in the data set. And the idea is that the trigger is used in the training phase to force the model into a decision path that it wouldn't normally proceed on. So in this case, we see a dog with a tennis ball. And this the dog is the actual picture, the tennis ball is the attack. To a human, that's a plausible picture. It could be a dog with a tennis ball, or a tennis ball could be in any scene, anywhere. But in fact, that tennis ball is used as a poisoning set during training to trigger the model to behave a certain way during production. And that's a very, it's a very challenging problem right now for deep neural networks because it's a very reliable attack and it's also very hard to detect. The second I'd like to talk about is the impersonation attacks, which is, um, uh, it's usually a, an attack in the real world of data that the, that the model is testing on. So what you do is you understand the behavior of a model and you manipulate the real world environment it's, it's using to, to determine its uh, attribution or its membership of, an, of, of a population and make it make a wrong decision. The most common examples are in uh, driving, automated driving examples. And in this case, I'll show you a picture of what happened with a University of Washington research study. They trained a model on a stop sign. And that stop sign is, was well recognized by 99.9% .9 recognition. And then they used a Gaussian blur. You see that, that, that sign has a little bit of a blur in it. It has sort of this strange, almost like a phi on the left-hand side, a Gaussian look to it. So they distorted the image just a little bit. And the model determined that it was actually speed limit 45. Just that manipulation of the real world data forced the model to a wrong decision path. And that's impersonation attack. So those are how machine learning is vulnerable to uh, cybersecurity events that we haven't typically seen in, in classical software development. Now I'd like to talk about how, uh, going on Rohit's additional conversation before, on how AI ML can be used to improve cybersecurity. And we have an example in Cisco, an example in general uh, consideration for the organizations to, to apply. The first one was detecting malware and encrypted traffic. Uh, today, the, the typical approach of detecting malware in TLS or encrypted traffic is to put a man in the middle in the enterprise. So any data going through this firewall in the enterprise is decrypted first, analyzed, re-encrypted, and sent back on the internet. Well, it's not 100% effective, this model. It's extremely computationally intensive, and it may be against the law in some, some geographies. So that option is becoming more and more limited over time. So how does an enterprise detect encrypted traffic? A malware in encrypted traffic. It turns out that we can apply machine learning to detect malware. And this paper discusses that. And in, in this model we developed, we were able to look at the encrypted flow of traffic and look at features of the actual traffic itself, the encrypted flow, to detect if it's likely to be malware or not. We can look at features like this, the entropy of the encryption. You can, you can analyze the entropy of the encryption and is, if, it, if that is likely to be malware or not. You can look at the, the communication path and the pattern, whether it's uh, chatty or it's a long outflow versus inflow traffic. Those all provide features 
to give this model indication of malware inside of the encrypted traffic. So it was a major innovation. It was very fun to, to work on that project. Then we also have an example for um, applying artificial intelligence to detecting insider threats. Now it's true that inside, insider threats have been reducing over time. It's the actual insider employee behavior as a threat has been reducing over time, but insider threat also encompasses the concept of advanced persistent threats where the malware is behaving as a threat as an employee in the enterprise. So what do you do to detect that unusual behavior? And Robert mentioned this briefly before, you're looking for unusual behavior that is outside the norm. And that's a good model to apply to machine learning where you can see a, a standard baseline. Here's the, the, the good flow of traffic and here's the occasional bad behavior. And machine learning models can identify unusual behaviors like an employee working with under, un, unusual groups or communicating with unusual servers or um, authenticating from unusual locations, things like that to give you to give the model some indication that some someone inside the company may be behaving badly and to an, analyze that and investigate it more fully. So that, that's a great example of applying machine learning to a fairly difficult problem of insider threat and APTs. So in final remarks, what I'd like to do is, is talk about the the application of machine learning. This is what we do in our, our group. I'm responsible, I'm in group responsible for securing Cisco's products in general. And we have a security development lifecycle we've built up. And the first steps we have when employing machine learning is, do you really need to use it? Is it necessary? Uh, it's a flashy object, it's fun, let's go after it. That's, that's what we do, we love that kind of stuff. But is it really, really necessary? Can you deal with uh, heuristical examples that are more conventional and still achieve the same results? If not, then apply machine learning where it's appropriate and engage experts in machine learning, not just machine learning itself, which is critical, but also domain experts. So let's say that you're, you're um, detecting a face in a video conference call so you can mask and, and, and shade the background. Maybe you want to engage a physiologist or an artist to understand the shape of faces and how to apply that to a model. Those would not normally be computer science experts. So you may need to engage domain experts outside your typical domain. Make sure your data is accurate and clean and represents your population. So you want to make sure you have a good sample set to train the model from. Validate the performance of the model against expected population and adversarial input. So you, you test the model, you force it to make um, choices in, in difficult data and see how it behaves, how it performs. And more import most importantly, because machine learning models are trying to match what it expects to see in the population to, to determine an exact match of what it's looking for, monitor it during production because input data could drift over time and change. If it's a reinforcement model, it will change in its learning over time as well and, and, and behave differently over time. So monitor it during production to make sure it's behaving and staying consistent. And there's a promising new cyber domains for ML. And that's, that's what we've talked about already. There's definitely wonderful promise. And finally, I'd like to say, just be practical. And this Rohit brought this up as well, because a, a big challenge for machine learning models is 98% accuracy is awesome. That's very interesting. But in Cisco's example, we have 20 billion domain name queries a day. 30 million of those queries are unique in any given day. If you're gonna test uh, domain name service queries and see which ones are maybe not legitimate or a bad reputation, 98% accuracy produces up to 600,000 false negatives or positives. And that's a lot of negatives and positives to deal with in, from any given team. So be practical about how you apply it and make sure you recognize its limitations as you, as you move forward. So that's what I had today. But thank you for the time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Chris. So there's one question uh, from Nitin uh, Deshpande. Uh, you need to continuously monitor model and retrain it if there is a drift in performance. The next iteration could be another best model, which needs to be taken into production. What's your say on this? Yes, that's very true. And in some cases, if your model is performing badly in the wild and in the real environment, because you didn't train it on a popular population set or seeing a new, new data set you didn't expect, you may need to overtrain it and even try to overfit it with the proper set to, to move it back to where it needs to be to support the proper model. 
So it, it's it's a continuous process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. This was the question from you and for, for you. And hope the audience enjoyed your uh, presentation and I thoroughly enjoyed it, the challenges and the things which you told, how to overcome Thank those. So, thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the lovely presentation. So guys, we'll quickly move on to our next talk, which is an interesting talk. I think. Yeah, it's a panel discussion. So we have, uh, in the, for the panel discussion, we have Chitre, we have Sachin, we have Ali. Perfect. So yeah, so, and we have Charles. So we have four great speakers. So Chitre is uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer InfoVision, as well as is the CEO of Digit7 as well. Sachin is CEO and CTO of Scogniz. Ali is Director of Industrial Cybersecurity at E98 and Co. Charles is Chief Risk Officer in Intel International INCs. Over to you, Chitre. Sure. Thanks, Nadir. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, Faris, uh, Rohit, and uh, Chris, wonderful presentation. Really uh, top-notch information about what's going on in the uh, cybersecurity, especially AI space. Uh, really, very informative. Uh, Chris, you nailed the information of how you can still apply the malware detection in the uh, data transferring uh, while it's going on the TLS system. That's true. Really good. Um, uh, good morning, guys. Um, Sachin, Ali, and uh, Charles, uh, welcome to this uh, panel. First of all, um, let me quickly let me quickly introduce myself. This is Chitrai Mani. I'm the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer from InfoVision and the CEO of Digit7 Labs. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, moderate this uh, panel team. Uh, let me start with uh, some of the main things going on in the industry, as you know. There is a lot of hype is going on 5G, right? So cyber, when you talk about 5G, uh, what we have now and what we are going towards, there's a lot of uh, hype is going on in the industry, especially when I talk about uh, how cyber security, because definitely we are not mature enough to say cyber security is guaranteed to secure 5G network. That's everyone knows that we are, have to expand a lot because the current network infrastructure securities is nowhere close to uh, 5G security. Pretty much most of the leaders know this very well. Uh, the question to the panelist, um, how A will improve the 5G cyber security? So open questions. Who would like to take uh, Sachin? Yeah, yeah. maybe uh, uh, yeah, I'll just give maybe uh, what limited knowledge I have. I think uh, experts like Ferris and Ali probably here, they can give uh, more uh, light around it. But if I talk more from an enterprise point of view, see the more proliferation of the data you have mm -hmm. in the system, and that is bound to create more risk. And if we go back to, uh, I actually really liked uh, what Rohit presented and, and there was a question also towards the end when somebody asked about the classic security and, mm -hmm. and we all probably have seen in a lifetime how those classic security models, uh, which was more like a perimeter network in an organization. And I still remember those days when uh, people used to have firewall and they, they thought the security is done and they are, they are like almost 100% secure. And now with the proliferation of data and, and with the internet in the hands of people, uh, which is actually processing data very fast and which is giving uh, access to a lot of applications and with everything moving to internet and how people are accessing, how, how fast they're processing the data and whatever the, and how the data is moving. I think that is increasingly uh, posing more risk for the, for the users as well as for the enterprises. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when you talk about, uh, especially, especially on the enterprise side, 5G, uh, current industry is going to face a lot of, uh, because the bandwidth more, the hackers will try to attack a lot of devices. The next move is going to happen, how the devices are going to secure as well, right? So uh, what is your view on uh, smart system security? How AA can help the IoT devices? Um, what do, you, what do you think? Because 5G, IoT, all is a back to back going to connect strongly in the future because now it's a smart city is enhancing a lot. So, how these smart cities industries, AI can help 
and prevent app. Currently, if you talk about IoT, there is we don't have strong security in IoT. Still, there's a big loopholes, right? So how A can help in the smart cities IoT industries? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, I'll chime in here for, for a minute. Um, so when we're talking about 5G, first of all, we're talking about increased speeds, uh, the surface is a lot larger with respect to capacity and so on. So that opens up a lot of vulnerability. So attackers and bad actors can leverage this also to their advantage. Um, your question with respect to um, uh, smart cities and, and, and leveraging uh, how to protect these. So um, the surface of attack continuously increases, right? The more digital assets we have out there, the larger the surface of attack becomes, right? So um, one of the things that we, we have a challenge in on the industrial side of things as well mm -hmm. is um, how do we protect the larger assets? How do you understand how many assets you have so you can protect these assets? So leveraging uh, artificial intelligence uh, in this case would be um, not necessarily the easiest thing, but it, it is the answer to all of that because it really supports the um, um, the the, uh, the the systems that learn normal behavior. I mean, I think that would be the easiest way is learning that normal behavior and then um, uh, alerting on anomalous behavior. So in my opinion, um, the, the larger your footprint, the larger the infrastructure is, and the more devices you have out there, the more challenge you're going to have with, with securing these assets. And, and AI could be the answer to all of that. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Ali. Charles, your point of view? Uh, you are on mute, Charles. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Charles Dumbrell uh, with Intel International calling in from Vancouver. British Columbia. Uh, I agree with Ali's points. Um, I think this is more in, in Sachin and Ali's wheelhouse, but uh, we'd agree on that. Smart cities also in, on the industry side I focus a lot here on the mining industry uh, with IoT and how it's spread across. Uh, you can have uh, very, very large, large operations uh, that are bigger than, than the island of Manhattan uh, and the IoT around that. that again, that's going to be a lot of um, catching up and throwing a lot of data there that uh, will take some time, but once it's implemented, it would help. But again, it's uh, a lot of these spots are in remote areas where 5G is not even uh, a possibility yet. True, true. absolutely, absolutely. And uh, getting to the next topic, uh, we would like to a little bit a uh, question about the area of how does AI play a role on the industrial side of the cybersecurity? Who would like to take it? Ali? I, I can chime in here. So um, just maybe go back for a second and, and talk about what machine learning and AI is. So machine learning is, is AI's brain, right, as we all know, which is really a type of algorithm that enables computers to analyze data, uh, learn from past experiences, and then make decisions on what it really uh, resembles, good behavior versus anomalous behavior. So just kind of wanted to put that out there for those who don't understand what AI and machine learning have to correlate with each other. So on, on the industrial side of things, uh, or what we call OT and operational technology, um, AI can be leveraged to detect anomalies, obviously, and, and even assist in detecting insider threat. That's one of the topics that came up uh, earlier today in one of the discussions. Um, so when it comes to OT and critical infrastructure cybersecurity, one of the most important aspects next to asset management um, to, to the asset owners is, is vulnerability management. Um, so these organizations typically struggle to uh, manage and prioritize a large number of vulnerabilities that they have to detect daily. So imagine you're an asset owner and you have uh, um, hundreds and thousands of assets out there at your facility. How do you understand what vulnerabilities there are in these assets? Uh, so they have that challenge. So understand how many assets you have, and once you understand how many assets you have, what are the vulnerabilities in these assets? So they struggle to manage and prioritize uh, these large number of vulnerabilities to detect daily. Um, so uh, con conventional like vulnerability management techniques um, by responding only to incidents um, 
after the attacks happen uh, and exploited, uh, this could cause uh, potential uh, devastating uh, effects on, on these specific critical or, or, or industrial side of things. Now, AI and machine learning uh, techniques can certainly improve the vulnerability management capabilities. Um, tools uh, such as uh, like uh, user and event behavior analytics, when it comes to AI, can when when that can analyze user behavior um, or system behavior on endpoints, uh, and then detect anomalies that might um, indicate unknown attacks. So um, knowing the unknown kind of thing. So uh, sometimes you have your insider threat, uh, not necessarily also a uh, uh, targeted. So the insider might not know he's causing an, a, a threat there. So this can really help protect organizations or industries even before the vulnerabilities are officially reported and patched. Um, so this can be really beneficial for OT, so operational technology systems that cannot be patched, as we know, as often as IT systems uh, because of the limited downtime requirements there. But how uh, mature it is now? You are saying it is going on a lot of uh, attacks are happening. There is a lot of AI is needed. But do you think it is quite mature or still it is progressing now? What is the state in the AI side, especially in the industrial side? So AI in the industrial side is certainly not as mature as it is on the IT side. So on the OT side, um, there is quite a bit of testing and validation that needs to go in place um, before systems are released. Obviously, if, so when you're talking about industrial side, let's take utilities, for example, you're running a power plant and you introduce an AI system that could potentially take over, overload the system. Now you trip a power plant now you're, 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 you're causing a, a trickle effect that uh, maybe a small city or, or a community does not have power. So that's, that's, a, that's a big problem to deal with, right? Versus your IT system goes down and now you just reboot it and bring it back up. So when it comes to AI on the industrial side, um, the maturity level is still not there. It's, it's certainly in the works because we do want to leverage AI on the industrial side to help us. Mm -hmm. Um, tackle the more sophisticated attacks. As you know, there's more sophisticated attacks on the on the industrial side. Uh, but from a maturity perspective, it's it's still not there. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So uh, moving on to the next question, uh, this is definitely detailed information about the uh, uh, industrial side. So quickly talking about uh, what are the key cybersecurity challenges organizations are dealing with in current times? Um, and what you are predicting for the next couple of years is going to be a major impact. Um, Sachin, uh, would you like to take it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, as we know, the biggest challenge uh, which is in front of us uh, is the remote working uh, because of pandemic. And uh, I think that also brings to some of the uh, points we have already discussed, uh, like how the attack surface is changing. And uh, before pandemic, the challenges uh, we all had were, were slightly different. And, and the focus on cloud security, DevOps security was in discussion, but uh, the movement was not that uh, that fast. And and with that change, when, when this disruption happened, and people were struggling to figure out uh, what to do and, and how to respond to those events. And I think first six months went into do that unexpected uh, uh, events and then and what kind of uh, action should be there and and the next six months went into really planning those things and then how how to secure this and and to your point also around uh, I think IoT and and 5G and and I think whenever we look at something new the, the technology changes very fast mm -hmm. and and the security is something which which does not keep a pace with the changes in the technology and it follows later. And if you look at even cloud, when cloud uh, start, when people started out adopting cloud, there were no security standards and there were no compliances also on that time. Yeah. But if we look at how security has matured now and and especially uh, with uh, for some of the advancements using AI and ML, at least some of those uh, tasks which which are revolving around massive size of data which is uh, and this data is coming from all all pockets whether it's, it's a iot sensors whether your applications there's a huge amount of data which you have to process and which is beyond the human scale 
uh, problem. And you, you really, really need these AI powered engines, which can actually analyze mm -hmm. these data. And, and, and the challenges which evolve around your uh, cloud security, DevOps, AI, uh, IoT, and, and you mentioned mm -hmm. smart city. I mean, there's so many, so many challenges. And, and we all can, can see how some of those events happened, uh, this, uh, this pipeline, the gas pipeline in US, and, and, and there have been few events in other parts of the world where the attackers are actually taking advantage of, of these systems and, and how they are becoming more sophisticated while the, the security at some of these organizations are still running either in a classic mode or maybe they are they're just trying to keep pace with them. And, and I think these challenges will continue to evolve Mm -hmm. And for the next couple of years, uh, all this industrial security and uh, and the 5G network and cloud security, I think some of these challenges will definitely come into play. And then, uh, and I think uh, uh, Charles also touched upon the insider threat, and that is actually a threat which is still evolving. And AI mm -hmm. is also trying to help with that. So Charles, uh, what do you see the risk perspective, Charles, in the upcoming and upcoming yeah, years? So uh, with with Sachin as mentioned, we're still a bit off on that, um, but it is getting closer every every attack. Every um, you're seeing that convergence between physical security, cybersecurity, business continuity, crisis management. They're all getting closer and closer. Every major incident that we uh, see in our headlines every day. Um, a lot of it right now is uh, still very much these bad actors that are uh, nation states that are connected. Um, connected, excuse me, to nation states. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the next 10, 15 years, we're still going to see more traditional attacks uh, where we'll be leveraging uh, human factors will be prevailed. Um, you're, you're seeing it today with uh, uh, in politics uh, with elections. Right now, you're seeing uh, these sort of propaganda farms that are being run by humans, but they're also integrating AI into it with uh, with uh, popular apps or uh, right. programs such as uh, using bots to, to create photos of people that have never existed. Uh, there's that, you know, know, on side, that sort of thing. You've got uh, social puppet accounts uh, for malign influence campaigns. You're starting to see it also with uh, AI writing um, and people writing out content and propaganda. This is only going to develop more and more where you're going to have hate uh, propaganda uh, created by the by AI uh, that will be replacing these these human farms right now. Uh, you'll see more of that happening during elections. Um, so maybe in the next three years, four years, we'll, we'll start seeing that from other nation states. I'm a little scared about GAN technology, what Charles was talking about. <laughs> so this, you can create a person who is not available but is a human or any kind of object, maybe bird or maybe anything. Uh, that's really a scary thing. To see, but it's advanced in the technology. Hope we will mature in the security as well. Relevant to the question, um, I know is everyone is talking about how it's going to secure your cyber security, right? So how we can avoid the attacks. But the hackers are also using the AI. So how this will go through, right? So it's a pros and cons on both sides. The people can use it for a good thing or bad thing. What can be done? The hackers definitely using it for AI. So this is not a technical side of question, but how do you see this? Uh, so how we should the ethical hackers versus the real hackers. So how we should think, how we should deal with it? In my opinion, I think we always need to be one step ahead of uh, the bad actors, right? That's that's the only way you could uh, try to mitigate as much attacks as possible or mu as much damage as possible. Um, now, if anybody tells you we're, yes, our solution or whatever we do will 100% protect us, We've seen attacks on air-gapped systems that still happen, right? Um, it's impossible. Uh, so there, there are methodologies, though, that are in place. Uh, one of the uh, partners that we just uh, completed a partnership with is Idaho National Labs with the Department of Energy here in the U.S. Um, and one of the solutions that they have, the, the methodology that they actually patented and released is uh, called CCE, uh, Cyber-Informed uh, um, engineering solution. So it's a consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering methodology. It's a patented methodology. 
And all it does is really gives you, uh, puts you in the perspective of the bad actor and the attacker. And it ensures that you're a few steps ahead of them, or at least, you know, uh, from, from an insider perspective, we know more about our systems than the attacker. So that gives us an advantage to be uh, maybe a hundred steps ahead of the attackers, right? So as long as you're always ahead of the attackers, an attack's going to happen inevitably, but if you're always ahead of the knowledge and what they have, uh, uh, then then you, you could always try to mitigate as much attacks as possible. Sure. Yeah. More no, I more agree. Much- yeah. I agree with Ali. Yeah, uh, see, it's uh, it's actually a never-ending game, and, uh, <laughs> yes. and, and and the more advancement you have, the more algorithms you have, uh, uh, the attackers will, will find a way, and, and they'll probably use the same set of algorithm or maybe more advanced algorithms to break into. And and you have to figure out what are those uh, gaps in the system which can be exploited and how you can be ahead. I think that's the that's the game I think uh, all mature organizations and industries have to play, uh, how they can be ahead of the attackers and how they can con- constantly change that thought process of looking at uh, the enterprise grade security. Absolutely, absolutely. So more I agree with that. It's uh, looking at what the adversary would be doing, red teaming, um, you are really fighting fire with fire, but uh, you, as Ali had mentioned, you know your system best and be able to, to have that advantage. But at the same time, uh, we're seeing incidences um, like the the water uh, treatment plant in Florida last year, uh, where there have been breaches in the past, and those new tools are becoming accessible to hackers that black hat hackers that have not had that uh, before. So. If breaches keep coming in, uh, rolling in like that from uh, from agencies getting breached with their tools being shared, then uh, that's a big that's a big headache for us. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, those are really important points. What you brought up first, you should know. You know, you are the best one who knows your system. First try. That the first just really has to go through. That's an important point. It's not someone coming outside doing. It. You are the better one. Right? So uh, some of the uh, questions are going around in the industry. Let me put that way. We have a network security, data security, application security. There's a lot of layers of security, right? When you talk about security perspective, because attacks can happen any layer. Do we need to focus on products to bring into the system? But because a lot of companies are trying to, normal uh, companies are trying to invest on writing some algorithm, how to prevent some attacks, right? I'm not talking about a completely DDoS attack or all the other, but do we need to focus on only cybersecurity in the sense of using some products only, or can the company can write their own A intelligence to detect their attacks in a different area? I think it's uh, if we look at uh, traditionally, it's a it's a combination of people, process, and technology, and and my my belief is that the products alone cannot solve the problem we all are facing, and obviously. Uh, if you look at even the AI space, you have to train the system. The AI systems need a lot of data. And actually, they need massive amount of data constantly to learn through those events and, and, and the kind of threats you are exposed to. And then you also need to design the processes. And, and, uh, and obviously, you need uh, skills. And that, that is actually a problem which the industry is facing. I think almost every, everywhere you see shortage of uh, cybersecurity, good cybersecurity skills. I mean, you could find uh, maybe traditional security guys, but uh, changing their mindset towards cybersecurity is actually a big, big challenge. And, and these uh, three uh, pillars, what we usually call, are actually very important to deal with any challenges you have in the cybersecurity space. And one of the things I would chime in here is awareness, 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 right? Um, your system's as secure as your weakest link. So if you have, you've trained hundreds, thousands of employees on how to follow security protocols and one uh, employee just uh, opens a, uh, a spam email that just introduces your entire organization to an attack. So awareness is, is really critical and continuous awareness. Um, now uh, organizations are becoming a little bit more 
creative with how they uh, um, reflect this awareness, right? You have these cartoon videos and you have these uh, courses that you need to pass on a continuous basis. So um, it, it has helped. There's still gaps. Uh, but as we continue to do, I mean, it, it only takes one person to click the wrong link and that's it. So continuous awareness uh, can never be stressed enough, I believe. Yeah, I know. And, and if I if I actually, I usually put it other way around. Right? And the while the humans are the weakest link in the chain, uh, they are also the strongest link in the chain. And that that strength can come only by the awareness. True, true. Yeah. Awareness culture, it's more kind of cultural adaption of uh, security awareness has to come. That's what it should be part of the program because now we are everyone at least wearing three, four, five devices minimum. The headset, or, uh, smartwatch, smart devices running everything. So at least uh, if Basically, non-technical people also should aware of what is at least some attacks, how to secure the basic things as to move forward. 5G is going to change a lot, I'm expecting. And, Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with that. And it's, again, back to your point of the culture. Uh, and it's our job as uh, managers in this industry to, to, uh, to learn human behavior and to be able to connect with our coworkers, our, our, uh, our clients, to be able to, to share that that knowledge and be able to make sure that they are aware of the importance of this and doing it, whether it's taking them out for lunch and doing lunch and learns or doing monthly meetings. It's just, and that repetition of being able to connect. It's important yeah, absolutely. to keep yeah, it absolutely. top of mind. Uh, especially uh, in the cybersecurity space, how do you look automation? Okay. What is the key area to improve automation for cybersecurity uh, side? Uh, because automation across is uh, spreading across everywhere. Hey, how much I can automate a lot. But uh, cybersecurity is the people are not looking at cybersecurity automation. They are still looking as a separate thing. It is going to block before anything comes. But nobody is thinking about automation of the cybersecurity side. So what what is the key area we should focus on the automation for cybersecurity? I think um, leveraging uh, um, certain tools uh, to help automate a lot of the detection and response on the IT environment side. You can actually um, have systems that can intervene and block certain attacks, right? Uh, if you all recall when uh, the WannaCry or NonPetya attack happened, um, some of the tools or very few of the tools that were out there that were detecting this type of attack um, actually could isolate certain machines that have been um, targeted, right, and not allow this um, infection is spread across many other systems. On the OT side, uh, on the other hand, the industrial side of things, you can't um, allow the system to intervene and block um, certain uh, controls or certain communication just because when you do that, the system completely shuts, could shut down, right? And then you trip a power plant again to our point versus you take the IT system offline. They're not two, um, two of the same things. So automating a lot of things, increasing the detection capabilities. Um, so uh, early detection is, is pretty important. So when automating your systems to uh, detect certain uh, anomalous behavior of certain machines on, on a network and quickly intervening um, and, and isolating these machines effectively, um, this is where I believe automation could really support uh, uh, with, with the cybersecurity side. Of Absolutely. I think someone also asked the same question, I think, to Chris, if I'm not wrong. How to update my latest model training so that it can improve the security risk? Uh, so that belongs to more automation side. That Because in, if you talk about in ML ops, we used to call ML ops, it's not quite matured in the industry. How to upgrade that, how to process it, pipeline prop, it's not quite matured. That's why every, a lot of new companies are investing on this platform. I definitely look at in the next upcoming two to three years, the ops, AI ops will be matured more in the cybersecurity space to train more data. Perfect. I think, uh, is there any question before I move to the next some of the topics? Okay, you know, recently the attack happened in T-Mobile, right? So the, especially in the telecom industry, uh, there's a recent attack happened. Uh, so we are talking about network is the base, all the data, everything. We are talking Wi-Fi or 5G. The attacks happen in the core of companies itself. Uh, so don't, don't you think uh, the company is not taken a measure because those are big companies. They have taken a measure definitely in all the point of view. A lot of experts, if I'm not wrong, more than a, the CISO group is completely focusing on how to detect it, right? But what 
what is the what makes them it's a new attack or it's kind of something they have a little bit kind of uh, uh, less focus on some of the area mystic so what do you feel normally this for example the water florida water organization got attack right you mentioned last year so all this what is the primary thing uh, they missing it currently in the industry which is giving a loophole to the attack hackers they can penetrate easily i would say unpatched systems um provide you know vulnerabilities that have been exploited already um that attackers are used to uh, that would be a, a, a very easy vector for attackers to exploit um so i would say um unpatched systems and systems that um would typically not have any whitelisting solutions or any zero trust solutions um would be the most prone uh, systems to to attacks even patched systems today i mean vulnerabilities come uh, are discovered and uh, exploited on daily basis so how quickly can you patch on the industrial side again going back to industrial um side of things you can't patch a system while the system is in operation right you could trip a plant you could cause a lot of harm to the system so you have to have a waiting period where these patches are tested validated and then you have to wait for your downtime so we're going to go offline for this amount of time we're going to patch the system mm-hmm. so unpatched systems uh, definitely provide this uh, this uh, uh, larger threat when it comes to uh, um, early uh, 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 early uh, integration to the, the these sides of uh, the the network systems yeah truly this patch money this patch money is very important stuff when we have seen some of my customer got attacked without some of the system not being upgraded to the latest patch got impacted so very important point yeah. agree yeah and, uh, yeah they, they just like to add on see it's uh, obviously uh, i agree with ali what he mentioned about the unpatched system and and at times it is uh, <clears throat> that uh, that behavior or maybe uh, maybe at times people take few things casually and and probably they do not Uh, see any threats coming in that area and they overlook certain areas and where it, it and this mostly happens with the access rights and and i see i mean those some of the organizations actually have have done quite a good work in managing those identities and access but uh, there are still many companies large companies where account provisioning deprovisioning is still a challenge and and that that life cycle actually creates a lot of threats and if somebody gets into that and it becomes very easy for for the attacker to exploit and and even even the patching i think we all remember that solvent story and uh, and how those updates can actually bring uh, threats to you and even some of those old uh, intel processor based uh, threats I mean, nobody nobody over could actually get into those areas that you can and actually face threats from that side absolutely yeah that's true uh, charles especially to charles, charles this question um, uh, has he a chief uh, risk officer so what is the how do you measure the impact of this uh, cyber security anything attack happen how, what is your measure so how do you measure it is a major impact mid impact for example every company get attack right so how do you measure it what is your uh, as a risk officer you you deal with this customers every industry is going to be different some are more um invested into ai and how connected they are uh examples of it are um that i that i can think of it's telecom is one of the leading ones mckinsey always comes out with a monthly with an annual survey uh mm-hmm. measuring different industries that should be coming out again a new one next month um one one thing that i would measure be um looking at uh I can't remember the name of it uh, the attack earlier this this year this spring where the government got involved with the the shells and removing the shells um uh and that uh impact of showing how much uh, a lot of these smaller medium sized businesses are ignoring these attacks so I think that's a, an important factor on it but every industry and uh, company size is going to be different Absolutely. Absolutely, and I know someone mentioned in the presentation stating the shortage of cybersecurity engineers. So all of you guys, are, uh, all of your leaders, how do, how are you handling this situation? Because even myself, we are going through a lot. We are running a cybersecurity company, but how are you handling it? What is your point helping to the community to say that this is the way you can 
bring up to the speed of the shortage of this issue. Any suggestion from your side? Yeah, um, I'll I mean, at my, 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 my comments. Uh, see, the, this this shortage of cybersecurity skills is was a challenge with the with the pace of changing technology and and when you were looking at people who could probably address some of those uh, security related to your cloud, uh, which is traditional maybe infrastructure as a service or software as a service, then then you had DevOps and container security. It, it, it evolved so fast that you actually and either did you need to reskill those people or maybe look for people outside. And you will not be able to find good set of skills because this is an evolving field and, and, and a new field. And you would definitely need training. The one important aspect what we have learned is that whenever you try to work on something new, get that OEM to partner with you to train your guys both on operation as well as on the security. And, and with the time, obviously, it will, it will evolve. But the one the key point I have here is to keep on reskilling your own workforce uh, to whatever extent you can. And second, uh, use the automation as much as you can. And third mm -hmm. is partner with some of the best uh, security experts in, and, and consulting companies. On the industrial side, it's even worse. Um, we have a 3 million plus growing shortage uh, on the industrial wow. cybersecurity side. Um, and, and, and again, still growing, right? So finding these folks is almost a needle in a haystack. Um, just because, I mean, there, you could, the shortage for IT security is, is we know is, is, uh, is there, but for OT specific, so somebody who knows the security aspect, but also knows automation controls, uh, the SCADA things, um, how PLCs communicate with each other, that's even more of a niche um, to find out in the industry. And, and today, the industrial customers, um, they, they understand that there has to be a difference between IT security and OT security. And uh, um, they want the expertise that know their controls and they can recover if, for example, um, uh, communication between PLCs is not happening, plants about to drop, an IT security uh, expert might not understand that language, right? So you really need the OT security uh, experts mm -hmm. that understand this type of language, a SCADA language. They can also de do the security thing. So from our perspective, it's a little bit, it's easier to find the SCADA folks and then put them through intensive cybersecurity training certifications and all of that, then go in the route of getting IT security folks and trying to change their mindset into the OT side. But again, we, we are suffering from that perspective as well. But but everyone is looking for always senior cybersecurity people. Nobody's interested in, hey, junior to because you can take a risk in uh, training the programmer. For example, it may be Java, .NET, or React. That's good. But nobody's trying to take a risk in cybersecurity. The pressure is the creator. Look close, you're done. You are answerable for multi million, multi billion dollar company. So I don't know how that is going to fix. But if you are anyone fresher in this group community who's audience, please take this as a chance. Cybersecurity area is growing really fast, it's a good uh, area to focus uh, instead of other technology. And there is, uh, intermittently, we can take some questions from the industry. Uh, uh, some of them posted a question. Um, his name is uh, Caroline uh, Duby. What are the trade offs between open AI using known algorithm and black? Box AI uh, proprietary and embedded in the project. Which one we should go? That's what their question is. More proprietary model, embedded model, or open AI model, uh, which we can use it. In my view, uh, see, it depends. Uh, but the open AI models uh, suits actually most because it's constantly evolving, and and you can uh, you can uh, I'll just go back to what Charles was also mentioning that that. That attack simulation, and, and you can actually uh, constantly simulate and then that, then uh, then teach that that system. Mm -hmm. And and proprietary model, most of the time, it actually hits the limitation, and uh, it will work on some of the known algorithms, and it this will not allow you to to maybe explore it further. Okay. 
quick question. I think um, Ali was mentioning uh, the awareness creation about the security, right? How do you just let's uh, step back a little bit about industry, forget industry. How do you uh, create awareness at your home? So a lot of you, all of your family might be using devices, a lot of devices, right? First of all, let's start from here. How do you create awareness from your home? Just, it's including myself too, but so uh, do you teach them or because you guys are strong cybersecurity side, what do you think? Is only corporate people should have aware of the cybersecurity or is even the normal people at home should have aware of it? If it is, what do you do? I think my uh, my two-year-old now knows how to operate a computer better than me. So that we, we're in a different era today. Um, this generation, I mean, they're so smart. They're born smart with technology for some reason. So, um, yes, the awareness becomes uh, challenging. Um, but uh, excellent question. A lot of us are also uh, working from home. At Burns and McDonald, we're back in the office at 1898 and co uh, we're all back in the office working from the office which is which is great um, but there's quite a bit of organizations that are still working from home and that also poses threat to the organization as a whole so if you somehow get compromised because your network security at home is not um, as mature as it is in the office then you ca- could cause uh, you know a uh, a potential breach on, on your organization's data and so on. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think uh, this is no different than being in the office, continuous awareness, maybe taking it from a, uh, a a fun kind of awareness perspective that's always there, but also um, lock down your network a little bit more at home. Uh, uh, use certain technologies and certain solutions to help um, secure your own network at home. Don't just... Uh, um, you know, rely on on the basic uh, computer malware and so on. Uh, do something with your with your network security, um, and also uh, lock down some of the computers or some of the iPads that our children use uh, from allowing any um, uh, foreign or unidentified uh, uh, URLs to to be able to open and so on and so forth. So I would say, next to the awareness, uh, do some work and secure your own network as well. That's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, see, uh, one is obviously uh, you can put a lot of controls around it, uh, just like you do at, at the office. But you know, at the same time, uh, probably uh, the users at, at the enterprise will listen to you and will, will probably see all your messages. They will not say anything on your face. But, <laughs> but at, at, at home, uh, they will argue, they will put questions, why we cannot do this. And, and kids, as Ali mentioned, I have two kids as well, uh, 13 and 11 years. And you can imagine if a two-year-old can pose a lot of challenges and and the kind of challenges I'm facing. And for everything I tell them not to do, they have 10 questions why they cannot do this. And you have to explain, which probably you don't have to do at, at the office. You just release a communication that, that's done. And then probably you have your team to take care of. But but I, I think uh, you have to tell all the good side and bad side of you know, the things. I think that is more important. And uh, and when you start talking about some of the downfalls, which uh, they can head and, and how they can become victim of uh, some of these issues, I think that can create a lot of awareness. And when this pandemic uh, started, uh, uh, I, I also wrote a paper uh, both for the people at my organization, and then uh, I also published it publicly where uh, I could ad- identify what, what, what are some, some of the issues people are facing. And, and as Ali mentioned, uh, there are pretty much every device in your home which is now connected. And, and some of these devices do not even require a password. And, and a lot of people still have the, the router which comes with default user ID and password. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very easy to break into you know, somebody if exactly. if somebody is talking to you and and then how you actually change that behavior how do you make make it more secure how do you put some controls how do you how do you basically let everybody in the house know the different some of the rules they need to follow. True, true. Charles, I, I, with, uh, I'm a optimist that worries a lot, um, but I also feel that um, I'm. 
hopeful with the future where uh, this next generation is all learning a second language and it, it's a, it's usually a language encoding. Um, so one, they'll be able to uh, create their own programs and protect themselves. Uh, two, as um, there's some great creative ideas to be able to connect with those generations, with those younger people that are uh, starting to get online. Uh, one was uh, the, the cartoonist for Garfield uh, had come out with a comic book on the importance of, of cybersecurity and uh, uh, was able to um, pick up some of those for, for some younger um, relatives of, of mine. Um, again, it is that that uh, discussing some of those practices that you ha- you mentioned at home. The, we are uh, the, the bad actors are going for the weakest link. Um, the, that weakest link may not feel that they are a target, but they may be a stepping stone to a more valuable target. Uh, examples of this uh, is how proactive and how aggressive. Um, exa- uh, uh, the attacks have been in the past, even in the past year, uh, where uh, Google has sent out an alert earlier this month in October um, of 50,000 accounts, personal accounts. These are not uh, work accounts. These are personal accounts that are uh, potential breaches from uh, foreign governments. Uh, so it's it's getting access to, uh, to people in other ways that other paths that people may not feel that they need to do. And keep in mind, Alexa is listening all of you talking, okay? <laughs> Alexa. So what are you talking? It doesn't matter. Someone is listening. It's not human, bad actor. So Alexa is there. A lot of products, okay? Nowadays, uh, uh, A is going to be a threat one day because uh, there is a robo which invented strike in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, it's it's trying to take uh, the, its own decision, okay? The future AI yeah, I'm looking for is AI is, nowadays is helping the other industry, no question, but one day we will create a A for securing AI, okay? That topic we'll talk after 10 years if I'm not wrong. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Um, I would like to quickly move on. Uh, one more question from um, uh, uh, Mr. Nickel. And cyber attacks are equally li- likely to happen in small grids and power systems. How A is implemented to secure or prevent from those? How burns, uh, bumps and McDonald uh, is working on this yeah I, I i can take this and i i can kind of tell a little story here about um to answer this question um so uh, one day we've implemented a solution at a uh, nameless plant a customer of ours um and uh, the systems were completely um not connected to the outside world, right? We all know that there are some segregations between IT, OT, uh, but at this plant, it was completely, completely not connected to the um, IT side of things. So it was a small network within itself uh, just to run specific controls. Um, We had an AI solution that was uh, sitting on the system. It was learning the behavior of the system for a long time. Suddenly, we've discovered, uh, or there was some alerts that the um, uh, there's information actually l- leaving the system and pinging different IP addresses on the internet itself, and we were baffled because we know the system is completely unplugged, right? So, um, after investigations and after um, really physically going there. Um, somebody put a ladder on top of the building, went up to the actual building itself and found a drone. And that drone had been flown over at night and that drone had a wireless sniffer and it was sniffing for a just a wireless card that was uh, dis- even disabled on, on one of the machines. So, um, so the attackers are becoming more and more sophisticated, right? Uh, we were able to obviously contain the situation, but this kind of goes and tells you that um, the, the sky is the limit when it comes to the attacks that are happening on, on critical infrastructure. Um, so so leveraging these AI solutions to help identify, hey, there's there's an abnormal behavior here. Um, your data, there's it's pinging IP addresses in one, two, three, four. Um, you know, how... You, 
you need to pay attention to this and, and, and how do you respond to this is, is probably more critical. So I kind of wanted to tell the story just to kind of give you that imagination of anything is possible. Somebody flew a drone, activated one of the wireless cards in the building and started pulling data from the system. They didn't cause any harm yet, but, uh, but we were able to detect uh, something to this extent. Wow. I hope this answers your, answers your question. Perfect, perfect. And very interesting topic, really. This is, I love this question. And uh, let's a little bit talk about zero trust. I think we are talking about cybersecurity. Zero trust is an unavoidable terminology nowadays going on. But zero trust is wide, right? We are talking about all the layers, network or application data, securing many areas. But so uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think uh, can zero trust be leveraged in OD yet, operational technology yet? Um, yeah, sure. So on the operational technology side, uh, the networks uh, are really a growing target of uh, the interest of cyber criminals, especially for the nation state, as, as Charles uh, mentioned earlier. So the premise behind the zero trust access is really that, that if um, it's not safe to trust anything inside or outside your network without first identifying and clarifying all users, and then the devising, devices that are seeking access. So the goal of this is really to eliminate all threats, uh, whether they come from outside or within your network. So let's say Ali has access to this network or to this machine. Every day he's an operator. He comes in and he uh, does um, one, two, three, four. Uh, one day Ali showed up and he sat on the system and he actually did one, two, three, four, but he also did five, which he started maybe downloading code from a PLC device. This is anomalous. This is something that I shouldn't have access to it. So when it comes to zero trust, um, really um, identifying the inside uh, users, the systems that can have access to these users. So going a step beyond AI is, is not just, hey, this is anomalous behavior you need to pay attention to. It's no, this guy should not have access to this um, this side of the business or this side of the network and he should be completely blocked at this point and alert on top of that. So this is where we're seeing zero trust. Um, uh, we're, we're leveraging that today as well on the industrial side of things um, uh, really to try to secure both uh, inside or, or outside uh, potential attacks. Sure. You want to, uh, Sachin or Chalk, do you want to take zero trust time? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, no, I think what Ali mentioned for the industrial side of it, I think it's uh, pretty much true for the, uh, the story as well. And, uh, and one of the examples I mentioned uh, before, uh, when we were talking about uh, how what are the, some of the challenges, and we, were talk, we spoke about unpatched system, identity, and access management. <clears throat> and uh, these are some of those challenges where uh, some of these access rights are exploited. Even if you have access, uh, you are not using, but somebody may, they are able to get control of your account, how they can elevate the privileges, how they can actually misuse those privileges, you don't know. And 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 that's where I think that trust is some word I have seen at many companies before, and I still hear in some pockets where people say, no, we are, uh, this is our, our technology team. They have all the rights. They can manage everything, but uh, they don't know how some of those access rights are exploited. Uh, whether it's for uh, for some maybe some breaches or maybe it's just for just for the fun. Also, I've seen with some of in some of the companies. But uh, but I think with zero trust, how you actually uh, modernize your rules processes. And then create that combination with mm -hmm. help of products also, and how you basically redesign your security architecture. I think it's very very important where you actually give access on a need basis, and you you just don't give access just by the on the face of it, or just because you're part of some group or or some uh, some team, you get that access by default. I think. Uh, those things are becoming things of the past, and with, with things like zero trust, SASE, the entire security architecture is actually getting redesigned. True. True. So, uh, Charles, you are I, I don't have anything else to add on that, but to to Ali's uh, 
storytelling. I think that's a very valuable lesson I wanted to jump back to. Um, and a point I wanted to make before we, we wrap up things here is um, this, as I mentioned, the convergence of the physical, the cyber, uh, the business continuity, crisis management, uh, getting in touch with the decision makers. It's, it's difficult to get your point across and to understand and to explain these complex ideas. One uh, strong resource that I've found is a, is a uh, colleague of mine, I actually had a talk with him on another meeting uh, yesterday, uh, is an author named P.W. Singer. Uh, and his uh, business partner and co-author of books, uh, August Cole, have come out with a concept called fictional intelligence or useful intelligence. And it's explaining co uh, complex ideas through one of the oldest technologies uh, in uh, human history, storytelling. And it's being able to not uh, use science fiction and say a, um, in something too far off. It's, it's um, talking about the future within a generation. If you go beyond that, then you're talking magic and things that are concepts that we just do not able to comprehend right now. Uh, but it's sourcing all of your work, showing the technology that is available with the research now that this will become more mainstream. Uh, and it's a great resource to, as an example of some of his work, uh, he came out with a book last year called Burn In, uh, mm -hmm. August Cole and P.W. Singer. Uh, and it talks about law enforcement and the use of robotics and AI. Uh, and that technology and how everything from uh, this sort of drone robot that follows around a law enforcement officer to uh, be able to do facial scans, be able to pick up data on that individual, chase that person, uh, and be able to be that smart device and connect with government data, being able to throw out the facts and quickly answer to that uh, official that's out in the field on a project doing an investigation, um, chasing someone, that sort of thing, and it's getting all that uh, all that information available. What I'm trying to explain is that we're talking about a lot of things that may be very complex to uh, a lot of the decision makers. I want to just share this resource of this idea of useful fiction, fictional intelligence, and examples with this author, P.W. Singer, and all this cool. Absolutely, absolutely. So a quick question, I think we are pretty close to the time, two minutes time. Uh, I would like to have a, just a quick uh, information to the audience uh, from all of you stating that, what is the current trend in the cybersecurity? Uh, if someone stating from your standpoint would be really great. Um, Sachin, would you like to start with? What is the trend and uh, it may be products, maybe this is the model, we can just roll dice. Yeah, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned in my previous point, that security architectures are, are getting redesigned. Uh, with this uh, AI and ML come into play. And, and if we look at uh, pretty, pretty much all the products, the security products we, we see as of today, they have this inbuilt functionality where they are trying to process the data. They are trying to give you intelligence, uh, which is what we need to build. And, and building that threat intelligence is actually becoming very, very important so that you gain the visibility, what is happening inside your network. And, uh, and this is uh, actually having more relevance when people are adopting cloud and, and some of those uh, uh, software as a service products. And this is becoming more challenging because the data is now moving out of your traditional boundary and, and data is now traveling uh, to the cloud, to various applications, how you're integrating uh, some of those applications and data sources. And, and that's where a lot of these challenges are evolving. And Another challenge we spoke about was uh, around the skills, and and that will I think also continue to happen. And and we uh, I, actually I spoke earlier in, in a different forum that the unemployment rate in cybersecurity is actually zero, and and that's what I think you also mentioned to the audience. But I think these couple of challenges are, are going to be there, and trend is uh, is to actually address uh, some of these. Uh, challenges uh, by using a combination of some of those best in class products and and also the other other trend i've seen is people are trying to consolidate some of those products and services they have actually adopted and and last maybe uh, whatever five to ten years or, or maybe lesser because when we talk about a lot of products uh, i see a lot of overlap or maybe a duplication of 
uh, efforts in uh, some of the security products. When you talk about some of some of things, let's say a compliance product versus maybe a maybe a threat intelligence product, they would probably have some overlap in between. And how do you actually remove that overlap and trying to consolidate uh, things so that you have better visibility uh, by way of correlation of some of these uh, uh, events within the company? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sajid. Ali and Charles, any point? Uh, on the industrial side, three things I would say: asset management, vulnerability management, and anomaly de- detection solutions powered by AI and ML. Short answer. Very short. You are running out of time, uh, Charles. I have to swap the question to you. Uh, what is your polit- what do you see in the political risk, especially on this? Uh, just a one minute question. Uh, we are running already out of time, so I would like you to take the political risk of this AI uh, cyber security. Yeah, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, just that uh, watch out with major elections, global elections. Sorry, uh, elections around the globe uh, of powerful countries and incidents happening where you do have these human farms, uh, these uh, by creating into these bots that will be able to use some of these tools. You're getting uh, GPT-3 Neo very accessible to the public, and uh, these new tools are are very powerful. And uh, you'll be replacing these human farms with uh, this these programs that will be able to create content, create hate propaganda. Uh, it's uh, it's something to watch on the horizon and uh, to be vigilant on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much for all of your time. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate here. Thank you. Thank Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. I think it was a lovely, uh, lovely panel discussion and you moderated it excellently. <laughs> and the questions okay. asked were all, all relevant and answers were to the point and it was a lovely lovely panel discussion thank you guys thank you thank all. you thank you so ali you stay here yeah <laughs> yes i will not going anywhere all right uh, just give me one guys, one minute yeah. to just set up and uh, pull up my presentation sure, sure. and meanwhile i'll let uh, introduce ali again to the audience so ali is our next speaker for the day obviously you know ali about ali he's a uh, Director of Industrial Cybersecurity in 1898 and Co. And that is also called Burns and McDonald. So yeah, uh, his topic for this next talk is cybersecurity resilience in the industrial sector. So Ali will take the stage and he will do the talking. Over to you, Ali. Thank you, Nitin. I am just about to share my screen. Just one minute, please. Sure. All right. Absolutely well. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, perfect. All righty. One second. Can you just move to the next slide just to have a... Sure. Oops. Okay. Yes. Okay. Done. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ali al Nimani. I'm the Director of Industrial Cybersecurity at 1898 & Co., uh, which is a part of Burns and McDonald. We serve uh, the industrial side of the business, uh, which covers all critical and non-critical infrastructure sectors. Um, OT, uh, which stands for operational technology, uh, specific attacks are typically more sophisticated in nature um, than IT attacks. So they are typically attacks that are initiated by either, either nation state um, or, or, or others, uh, uh, states for, for economic or political gains. Um, as we look at the number of OT specific cyber attacks over, over the years, uh, we noticed that they have, uh, increased in number, but they also have increased in the sophistication of these attacks. So the latest one uh, that we've all heard of is the solar wind attack, the targeted software solution um, that uh, is highly utilized on the industrial sector. 
Um, so, one second. It's moved on, right, to the next uh, slide, just making sure. So yeah. let's uh, take a step back and really try to understand why OT cybersecurity, because we're going to talk a lot about this OT um, uh, acronym here. So OT, again, operational technology. The difference between IT and OT uh, being compromised is that when your IT network is compromised, it could be devastating, yes, to you, your organization. Nevertheless, the recovery is, is manageable to a certain extent. When an OT system is compromised, it could be devastating to an entire community, a city, and even a country, right? So the impact of taking down, for example, a power plant, a power generation plant, or, or a few plants, and even the grid would be a disaster today. So this is why we stress specifically on OT cybersecurity um, more than the IT side here at, at, at the uh, Burns and McDonald. So, um, so looking at the various critical um, sectors uh, such as aviation, federal, utilities, water, ports, and maritime, and many others that we serve here at Burns and McDonald, um, OT cybersecurity plays a critical role in protecting assets that allow continuous operations because disruption to any of these sectors will certainly impact our daily lives. So what influences OT cybersecurity today? If you look at the right side of the screen, um, you have the growing industrial cyber attacks, which we just talked about here um, uh, in the previous slide. You now have uh, regulations that fine organizations and utilities if they don't comply with certain cybersecurity requirements. You have organizations like NERC and FERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and so on. Um, so the third part is you have an increased surface of attack, which we talked about earlier during the panel discussion. Um, there are 20 billion um, IoT uh, industrial IoT devices out there, so on the industrial side only, um, and uh, it's still growing. So the more devices you have out there that are connected, obviously the surface of attack is is larger. And then finally, you have organizations uh, leveraging cybersecurity today as a competitive advantage uh, out in the market. So if you have uh, more cyber, you're more cyber secure as an organization. You're more appealing out in the market than others that don't care about cybersecurity. Um, so below here, you also see um, some of the impacts that an OT cyber attack could have on the different industries. So these are specifically to the OT side. The latest one, which I didn't mention here, is the pipeline attack that happened recently a couple of months ago here in Georgia. Uh, which left many of us out of gas for at least a week and a half to two weeks. Um, it was a devastating impact. Um, it was over a billion dollars in lost business uh, for that specific utility. Um, so now the question becomes, how can we battle continuous or the continuously sophisticated attacks in the industrial space um, and, and how do we, oh, sorry, I must have jumped two slides ahead. <laughs> so how do we, how do we address, um, these, the sophistication of these attacks in, in the industrial space and, and how do we, how do we help, uh, battle, uh, against the growing, um, attacks? So we, there's a three-step methodology, uh, which includes also solution implementation that we, uh, adopt here at 1898 and co. The first one is assessing, right? So you have to understand what environment you're working on. When I go into a utility uh, to support them, a power generation utility, a transmission distribution um, uh, utility, or, or maybe an oil and gas facility. Um, so the very first thing uh, that we do is typically try to understand what we're working with, right? What's the maturity of this organization in terms of cybersecurity? Uh, what are the uh, risk, threat, and gaps 
So typically conducting a threat or, or a vulnerability assessment will be one of the very first steps to help us identify and understand what we're actually dealing with. What level of maturity do we have here? That way you could baseline where you're starting. Um, there are various different types of assessments that will also dig deeper into the firewall, the segmentation, understanding how these networks are segmented. And that goes into the protection side. So when you understand your network and how it's actually segmented, um, if it's done correctly, um, what access controls there are in place, can anybody remote into this environment? Um, so all these are typically conducted at the assessment stage. Uh, moving forward to the protection stage, um, when you uh, take a look at what implementation you need to do um, after you've assessed and you understand what assets you have. So during the assessment phase, you actually um, do a, an asset uh, uh, inventory uh, so you can understand what uh, assets you have and how many assets you have that you need to protect. Uh, and then at the protection stage, you're actually implementing the cybersecurity controls and protection uh, solutions that you need to do um, on each of, one of these assets that you've identified that have these vulnerabilities. Um, you have malware and patch management. I mentioned earlier during the panel discussion that patching on the OT side is, is very different than it is on the IT side. Now, when you're looking at your IT environment, a uh, patch comes out from Microsoft, um, you patch your system, you reboot, you're back online, you get access to your email and so on. On an OT environment, you're running a power plant, you're running an oil and gas facility, you're in production mode, you're in a manufacturing facility. When you want to patch a system, that whole operations almost needs to be down unless you're, you're, you're patching different systems and different operational levels, right? So, um, so it's a different animal that typically when you're doing, dealing with utilities and you're patching a system in, in, at a utility, you are um, waiting for a specific downtime uh, that's identified by the customer. Uh, between these dates, I'm going to be down. This is when I'm going to be doing some of my maintenance. Uh, this is uh, when you can come in and patch uh, my system because the system will not be in operations. Now, if you patch a system while the system is in operation, you risk tripping the unit, tripping the plant. So that's that's one of the aspects of why patching an OT environment is completely different than patching an IT environment. Now, there are new solutions out in place, the OEMs uh, that um, provide these uh, control systems to the utilities uh, they are coming up with really uh, intelligent systems um, that would uh, uh, allow um, true redundancy. So you could shut down one part of your system, patch it, bring it back up, synchronize to your operations, shut down the other half of your system, patch it and bring it back up and merge it. But this is very complex in terms of uh, um, these, the architecture of these systems. Um, then you have uh, implementing uh, solutions such as zero trust um, access, zero trust design in your protection. You're, you're, you're segmenting your network. Now you know how your network is connected. You have your IT organization, your OT organization. There's a conversion there. How do you actually segment those two networks? Typically creating a demilitarized zone that sits in between those networks with firewalls and and, and uh, access servers, um, uh, and again, zero trust plus uh, identity and access controls is, is crucial here in this side. Um, and then you have your system hardening. So this is where you're going out to each of these assets in the field that are critical to the operations, and you're hardening these systems. And what that means is you're looking at a the device itself. You're understanding who has access to these devices, um, so do they need that access on this device? So really looking at the access controls, looking at the password complexity for each of these access um, or users that need access to this device. Um, taking, for example, a, uh, a network device 
uh, that passes communication between other network devices, between PLCs or between um, uh, clients that operate the plant. So if you look at this, this network device, looking at all these ports on these network device, um, are they all just enabled? Are they the ones that are not uh, used? Are they disabled completely uh, in, in the firmware? Um, now, the ones that are used, are they filtered to that MAC address of the device that they're connected to? So you're going above and beyond um, what uh, uh, what you would do when you, when you first install the system. So uh, in this case, if, if you have an insider threat and they wanted to connect their own computer or device to to uh, to cause uh, uh, any any harm or sabotage the system they can unplug that network cable for example from that switch plug theirs and have full access to the network even though you've, you've implemented so that mac filtering perspective could be important also when hardening the system so now that we've we've assessed what our network looks like what our environment looks like what the maturity level is um, does this utility or customer need to comply with certain uh, regulations? Uh, uh, you've understood the vulnerabilities within these assets. And finally, you've looked at the firewalls and the rules and, and everything goes in there. You've, you put together your plan. You went in, you protected, you actually implemented all of these different solutions. Um, now, what do you do next? Right. So uh, taking this a step further you need to implement certain controls with respect to detection, right? There are more and more sophistications that are happening um, on the uh, dark side uh, of the pond. So, so we need to implement um, more advanced solutions to help identify certain threats. So access management um, uh, or asset management as well, um, there are solutions out there that would help you identify um, and completely automatically and continuously um, identify assets that you have that are connected to your network in the field. The next point is continuous OT network and communication monitoring. So um, as uh, you have your system, you've protected it, you've implemented all these controls now, you wanna implement a continuous monitoring solution that is helping you detect early detect a potential attack or a potential threat. So um, these can be from anomaly detection solutions um, to others. And then finally, you really um, need to have uh, um, a, a good solid um, respond and recovery. Uh, so an incident respond and recovery plan uh, that's really important with respect to when you're down, so an incident happened and you're down, how do you recover and how do you come back to full operations? So the last point that I want to do here, and I think I have probably one one last minute to, oops, one last minute here to uh, to talk about is um, the, uh, the solution that I mentioned earlier with respect to Consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering. This is a solution that we've partnered with the Idaho National Labs on. This is a methodology um, that's patented. Um, when implementing this approach, you're assuming um, an aggressor's mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Examining how they think, how they might target most uh, critical components to disrupt operations. So this approach... Uh, as an as an asset owner, you're not looking at securing hundreds and thousands of assets out there in your facility. In essence, you're focusing on your most critical components and work your way from there. Uh, so it's really a very focused approach. So we're very excited about this partnership that we have and what it holds for the future. Uh, and, and my final comment here uh, is when we're talking about AI and how it really plays a role in all of this, AI and machine learning would be uh, truly leveraged in, in many, many scenarios here uh, from detecting, alerting on, on anomalous behaviors and even detecting the insider threat, which we've really talked about. So uh, with that, I believe my time is up right on point. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time for a few questions, Nitin, or not, but uh, I'll open the stage now for, for any questions. Sure, sure, Ali. I think it was a lovely, lovely panel discussion and followed that with a lovely presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Ali. Uh, so, uh
so we'll take questions if, if we have from any from the audience. So we'll just take one minute just to understand if any question is there. Otherwise, we'll move on to our next presentation. But yeah, thanks, thanks, Ali. I think it was a lovely, absorbing presentation with a lot of uh, key takeaways from the audience. Thank you. Well done. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. So, uh, Sachin is there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me okay? Great. Yes, Sachin. So, uh, Sachin, in the meanwhile, you can set up your presentation. Um, obviously, I'll let introduce Sachin. Sachin is CTO of Art Armis, and his topic for today is Digital Intelligent Industrial Transformation. So, over to you, Sachin, and hope audience will have a great time with you. Thank you. Thank you, guys, and uh, thank you for all the esteemed panelists and uh, the speaking engagement. It was absolutely phenomenal uh, to listening to all of those folks, uh, uh, especially, I think, the next subject. Uh, I believe I'm going to probably do an extension to what Ali has already mentioned. Uh, so thank you, Ali, for uh, clearing path for me to talk about the futuristic of uh, the intelligent industrial transformations. I think it pretty much uh, jives to the next uh, topic. Uh, so uh, uh, what are we talking about? So it's all about uh, all the operational technology, industrial control systems, uh, in, uh, Internet of Things, uh, industrial IoT, medical of industrial IoT, or medical of things. And, and these are all uh, uh, the digital intelligence uh, uh, you know, transformations. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, next slide. Uh, uh, thank you all again coming uh, virtually from any part of the world that you are. Good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, welcome uh, to uh, the uh, you know AI force uh, course for uh, virtual events. Uh, they're doing an excellent job. So uh, 2021, the digital pandemic uh, uh, proving to be just as deceptive and strenuous uh, to stopping COVID-19 proactively. Similarly, I believe I think my previous uh, colleague uh, uh, panelists have already discussed some of the breaches that we have highlighted. And, and that was just on to the operational technology. Think about combining those into the uh, IoT and industrial IoT plus IT side of the house. Uh, it, it is mind boggling where things are moving in terms of the ransomware and the cyber threat agents. So as an industry, we must play a vital role securing uh, specially operational technology. And I think the reason why I highlighted this operational technology uh, uh, as because it's not about uh, just, uh, you know, doing a business interruptions, but the, the key risk uh, for the operational technology or industrial control systems comes in the form of three. Uh, the foremost and everything is all about life safety protections. And when I say life safety, I'm talking about human life safety. Uh, second rate comes in the form of, uh, uh, you know, the environmental impact. Uh, and I, I'll go back to some of the things. Uh, 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 what we discussed previously, uh, because these are the technology or operational technologies pretty much uh, provides you all the utility management and maintenance and services and uptime and availability, uh, whether you work in a particular facility that comes in the form of building management systems, uh, whether you work in a factory which comes on in the form of facility management systems or gas and chemical industries or oil. Uh, and the distributed, uh, you know, control systems. And these are the technology, uh, including the chemicals. So depending on the market industry that you work uh, within operational technology, it has a direct association to the life safety or any interruption to any of those uh, uh, controls and mechanisms get created and havoc, uh, might be a gas leak or chemical leak. And, and, and this is why uh, we should be paying a pivoting role, you know, securing this technology. Collectively, as I said, we need to outsmart the threat agents uh, uh, and to protect the critical infrastructure. So uh, just to break an ice, I think I'm going to be, uh, again, welcome you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the internet minute, uh, just to break the ice. Uh, we're going to be sharing one of the particular uh, video uh, and where things are leading into. Uh, into the endpoint security challenges. Uh, obviously, the parallel convergence happening uh, as many of folks coming from an IT side, but uh, moving into an OT world is one of the key uh, underlying uh, uh, sectors where nobody's paid attention. And I think if I go back to the history of OT, 
it was well uh, invented well even before even the computer was invented back in 1800s uh, starting with the invention of the lights and the bulbs and the standard oils and so the world and obviously we're going to be moving into the cyber intelligence platform and the data as an intelligence service uh, and if time remains probably qa questions so what happens in an internet minute uh, and i think uh, this is a sort of eye breaking uh, event just for an audiences and everything uh, and this will follow on to the discussions probably happen All right, so I hope uh, the video was uh, uh, able to you guys hear it. Uh, uh, and if you look at the video, I think one of the the theme point is uh, the challenges that billions of connected devices uh, that going to be upcoming into the worlds of 2020 to 2025 uh, uh, with the traditional and put secret challenges. So part of this, what I wanted to highlight is if you look at the video, the one thing that came out in one of the slide, I stopped uh, the cursor at 2015. Now, and the reason why I did that and I didn't move beyond 2015 to 2020 or 2021 is because if you look at the explosion-ness of uh, this connected devices has gone out of control. Uh, so there is nothing that I could fit in. And But there was also a catalyst event uh, happened, which uh, my previous assistant colleague have already highlighted during one of those, uh, uh, you know, key event that happened in OT. Uh, which is where the Stuxnets and many of the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure uh, viruses got introduced, uh, where it impacted the nuclear uh, power plant uh, from a nation state. And now the reason why I say the nation state uh, with the specific countries is because it's already been publicly uh, information. So including U.S. and Israeli, uh, uh, you know, uh, created a PCS7 Stuxnet virus uh, that impacted the nuclear power plant of Iran that uh, offset their research and development for about at least 10 plus years. Uh, now, and this is why if you look at the trends uh, from the managed device to the unmanaged device, starting from 2020, 2010, fast forward to 2020, we used to live in the worlds of the traditional enterprises with the web and the PCs and the servers. Uh, obviously, moving forward, uh, the explosion into the bring your devices uh, uh, that started with a PC and a mobile, uh, when Intel uh, started selling out uh, the Wi-Fi connected laptops, uh, which was another uh, explosion, uh, disruptive technology that came into the market, which uh, with Apple and the Mac uh, converting in the Samsung, they created another ecosystems with smartphone and tablets and laptops. If that wasn't sufficed, and I think this is where we are talking about the unmanaged uh, and Internet of Things device, uh, starting from our smart home network to the cars, to the worlds of factories, to the smart buildings, 
to the smart cities uh, or including include the uh, you know uh, whether it be retail or whether it be uh, the medical devices i don't know many of you uh, even uh, when we go to the hospitals so so many of those ics ot devices uh, that monitors patient health uh, critically have the similar vulnerability that we associate with our IT devices. And these are the devices directly manage uh, the patient care. So if you look at the explosiveness of this unagentable, and these are the systems, you cannot plug in an agent or your EDR solution or uh, you know uh, allow list or reject list uh, 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 sort of devices where you can install a, a antivirus software. These are running on a real-time operating systems, uh, which the reason why this device were invented is because of to do things uh, it's designed to connect it was it was they, they were not designed to do the security as a, a by a, you know it's it's a configuration obviously there was no in, inbuilt security because uh, when these devices were uh, converged uh, into the uh, uh, ot or ics or in, even in an iot world uh, its availability or uh, processing the data was a major in, in corporations uh, and because of it these are the devices it's extremely difficult to upgrade and uh, um, uh, uh, Ali has already mentioned uh, just patching a firmware on a pro program logic controllers or uh, any of the manufacturing processes it's not about patching but you need to bring down the entire factory when a company invests in a factory they invest anywhere between five billion dollar to 20 billion dollar so there is no such thing as a you know a parallel factory where you can run your uh, uh, utilities or power plant or oil and gas platforms uh, and then this is why it's very difficult to upgrade uh, obviously many of these are already under attack as we have seen uh, the rise uh, from uh, the, from it side to the ot side to the iot explosion it's almost 300 percent rise in an uh, attack vectors uh, so including things are becoming smart so we call it smart but in a in a cyber security world it also comes with the territory where it can be exploited just because it's smart requires a wi-fi connectivity it, it requiring a wi-fi connectivity kind can be uh, unmanageable in the environment where the segmentation has not been applied so if you think about uh, the traditional endpoint security challenge in some of the video that i highlighted you know okay, where we are leading uh, uh, into the next segmentation of uh, our next uh, convergence uh, of the enterprise uh, operational technology or industrial control systems so if you look at the some of the artificial intelligence technologies that i think some of my esteemed colleague had already talked about in a previous uh, speaking engagement or predictive maintenance so when it comes down to the operational technology the the one of the major thing that you have to understand some of the tool sets uh, that are incorporated into the manufacturing environment can range anywhere between $1 million to $100 million. Now, if a company invests in one of those, uh, and there are thousands of those uh, entity, whether it be robotic arm or a, a, you know, a pipeline or uh, you know, chemical device or uh, HMI or you know, infrastructure, predictive maintenance is one of the major thing uh, that is coming uh, into the industrial IoT. Uh, obviously, predictive maintenance comes with some of the uh, upcoming technology. What we call it is command and control or automated command and control, uh, which obviously requires a big data analytics. Uh, obviously, uh, some of uh, them <clears throat> already discussed the training management, uh, training our AI model uh, with uh, uh, reinforced or uh, you know unforced or uh, some of those care, you know methodology. Um, but when you go into into the convergence of ITO and uh, ICS, uh, these are the companies also not only have to deal with uh, the compliance of the IT side, meaning meeting the vulnerability and other, but these are the compliance that we are referencing, which requires for a factory to be running, for a facility to be running, uh, ensuring that they are uh, up and operated with the uh, absolutely fire code requirement, the life safety requirements. Uh, if you're running a chemical plant, uh, you are subject to the federal compliances with chemical uh, anti-terrorism factory standards. Uh, and the reason why these are pretty, uh, you know, stringent compliances because without you not proving the intent that you can protect this, you may not be able to operate uh, or even run your businesses. 
and uh, so and, and when I say compliances, we are talking about the permits. Uh, you are not getting a uh, you know a elevator, smart elevator permit to ride in your factory if it's not complying towards appropriate qualification of uh, the industrial assets. Obviously, the safety management we already talked about. That everything and anything that we talk about in ICS and OT revolves around life safety because these are the same systems that can inflict pain or a human can die if an adverse effect happen within the factory or the infrastructure. Obviously, then we move into some of the electrical efficiency or an operational efficiency and regulatory reporting. Uh, and this is one of the upcoming topic uh, that is coming out of uh, the some of the standards and you know the colonial pipeline and some of the uh, effect that we have seen with the solar wind. That okay, how do private companies or publicly traded companies going to be doing uh, regulatory reporting as part of their uh, you know rent somewhere of facts or some of the factory were down or some of the life safety were impacted. So this is something a very touchy subject is coming and obviously it all comes into the form of cybersecurity. Asset optimization is an, one of the major theme coming uh, through uh, asset, uh, uh, through artificial intelligence into the industrial IoT, uh, doing a performance optimization and the digital twin uh, activity. Uh, if you recall, I talked about when a particular factory is uh, constructed with a huge capital investments, anywhere between $1 billion to $10 billion, we have to understand that you cannot create a replica of that factory. So what are the technologies that will offset uh, from the software defined network or from a, uh, you know disruptive technology? And this is where part of that digital twin technology comes into picture where you can literally create a replica of your factory in the form of software and the assets, uh, providing the asset performance optimization, doing many of your qualification. Now, if you look at this, and this is what we talked about, up until now, we were talking about enterprise platforms and systems with all those full devices that we're talking about. Combining to this, it's always a growing ITOD at X surface. And I, I think given uh, what we are going with the parallel convergence, whether it be some of the disruptive technologies uh, that we have already talked about is zero trust or uh, industrial IOD transformation, ITOD convergence or big data analytics. Uh, where we are leading and and, and think uh, the next slide will probably where I want to highlight like now okay so we have all this uh, information with IT and OT and industrial assets all right so what do I do moving forward in terms of creating the cyber intelligence platform and I think this is where uh, uh, part of some of the information that we are highlighting is like okay what do you need at the core of it? Yes, uh, uh, we absolutely need to identify them. We absolutely need to protect. We absolutely need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, define and recover and response if something has happened. But how do we do it in an automation world where we have already talked about some of the key, uh, uh, you know, constraint hiring a knowledge base uh, or knowledge skills uh, certified people. Uh, let alone, like somebody mentioned, I believe Sachin, that okay, we have a zero, uh, you know, uh, unemployment in the cybersecurity world. And uh, Ali also mentioned that if you talk about cybersecurity in IT, now you're bringing all this PLC and OT and running, uh, uh, you know, the life safety systems, so whether it be fire, smoke, vapor, having this Nietzsche uh, world uh, understanding of an OT we are already thriving to not have a, a security skill set. So how we can augment this is obviously, it all started with the security data source. Uh, and and a part of this slide is you have to understand, think about this as more of a platform understanding. Uh, each and every company has their own digital transformation journey. Uh, and this sort of gives them where they stand in their transformation. So obviously it all needs all part of the security data sources. Governing the security data sources, obviously, I need an enterprise security message bus, uh, uh, and there are a lot of uh, supplier out there in the world, whether it be Kafka, Splunk, uh, Elasticsearch, but you need uh, that enterprise security message bus, and then converging all your security data lake, uh, meaning uh, all the log management systems, your, uh, uh, you know, coming out of your platform, your EDR solution, your SOAR or SIEM or asset management or CMDB, 
and then obviously creating your services uh, in, term, in terms of uh, providing the search capability, reporting capability, visualization, dashboard, and you know, machine learning toolkit. And in here, uh, this is where uh, the whole all uh, whole fun begins. So, uh, in irrespective of uh, whether you're coming from an IT or the OT, or uh, you come from a C world or uh, running a factory. This is where you can start and incorporating. Okay, now I need to start delivering a solution uh, to IT where they need to look in, into the the current threat and risk landscape. Uh, they can create a different dashboard, uh, maybe to the factory world. Okay, now I need to see what is my security configuration on a particular PLC and is it operating the way I expect it. Uh, you can have a different services. So these are this is where you can do all those uh, enterprise, uh, you know, user behavior, uh, behavior analytics and service intelligence, and combining this, <clears throat> the overarching uh, platform capability, what drives you towards the cyber intelligence platforms, uh, incorporating the, the latest and greatest technology, whether we're coming from a digital twin or uh, industrial IoT uh, uh, and and whatnot. So uh, moving back to the next slide, and I think this is uh, 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 my esteemed colleague already previously mentioned that, okay, so how do we create this data as an intelligent service? Obviously, it all starts with the data source and the use cases. Everything that you need to start with identifying, uh, identification, the attribution uh, to determine the potential impact of compromise. Meaning if I don't see I would never be able to protect or I will never be able to detect and respond and recovery. And this is not something, uh, these are the standard frameworks that NIST, NIST have also incorporated. Now in each and every use cases, the data source that coming out of an asset is a very critical. Uh, how much maturity a one can provide uh, uh, into the identification. Uh, it, it might be very easy on an IT world, but going into the OT world, like I mentioned, you cannot run your traditional security tool sets. Uh, when you run a program logic controllers or an edge computing, these are runs on the real time operating system. So doing the fingerprinting or running your traditional uh, vulnerability scanner can easily bring down these devices and uh, the business impact and the life safety issues. So doing it with a proprietary knowledge of industrial protocols uh, in identification and attribution is critical. It's a core function, whether it be IT or OT. Once you identify, obviously you need to protect by providing some sort of a host protection in the security configuration. Now keep in mind, when we talk about the host protection, some of these devices you cannot install the host protection agent because these systems are deemed to be available all the time. So you cannot interrupt the availability portion. So you have to do it with very unique uh, approach and how to protect these devices by doing some of the purdy model uh, networking uh, segmentation and micro segmentation. Uh, obviously the device configuration plays the maximum uh, role uh, into the, uh, the worlds of uh, industrial IoT uh, and ICS systems because this is where you get the max benefit out of it by uh, doing allow and reject list, uh, uh, doing the traffic analysis. Once you protect them with the appropriate uh, security control, uh, now uh, comes along, okay, so what can I do? Now that I have identity of an asset, I can protect it to a somewhat uh, uh, realistic manner, but what happens if I want to detect? And this is where you need to start doing a malware defense and the network intrusion prevention and detections. Uh, obviously the malicious activity in each of these devices that runs in the form of the SCADA environment, which is uh, if somebody doesn't know what SCADA means, uh, it's a supervisory control access data acquisitions. It's a form of a human machine interface that can talk to machine. Uh, in the worlds of operational technology. So it's sort of an IT device with a proprietary software running that can understand uh, the uh, OEMs uh, of Rockwell and Siemens and Snyder's and Yokigawa and so on and so forth. And this is where you can run some of those agent-based uh, controls uh, monitoring the device. Uh, uh, and obviously once I detect, I may need to do the vulnerability management, respond and recovery. Uh, and, and this is where I think it comes the maximum part of the previous slide, if you look at it. Now, all this uh, uh, requires a data source. Just in here, I, I can be able to converge about 100 data sources that I need to collect uh, from a 
uh, infrastructure uh, during similarly the single source of truth that comes from a multiplication of the security control. So by doing uh, the identification of the data source and combining that with the data as an intelligent service, putting a data intelligent platforms can give you the most benefit at the parks. But it all comes back to the maturity of uh, the overarching, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies uh, where they stand in the digital transformation journey. So I think with that, I believe that was my last slide, uh, and it's uh, open for question. Yeah, thank you, Sachin. Thank you, thank you for the lovely presentation and industrial side of the cybersecurity. I think it was a lovely, evolving presentation. Hope the crowd also enjoyed it. Uh, so any any questions, guys? We are running time up time. I think it's four five minutes up six minutes. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, just to let all of you know who have joined late that you can type in the question as and when as the speaker speaks, so that easy for you to uh, your easy to get your question answered at, at the end of the day, at the end of the sessions. Okay. So we'll quickly move on to our next presenter. Uh, so we have Ashish. Kundu, who is the head of cybersecurity research in Cisco Research. And his topic is leveraging AI and ML for cybersecurity, technical, and business challenges. So, yeah, over to you, Ashish. Uh, thank you, Nitin. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, to everyone, whoever uh, is, you know, uh, the corresponding part of the world. Uh, so, I'm actually right now just to make sure that you know there might be some internet disruptions in between um my apologies from the beginning but uh, i'm trying to make sure that the the you know the connection is going to work okay are you able to see my screen now or my presentation no uh, not able to see your screen ashish uh, we can hear you we can listen to you you can just share okay, the screen let me try. Uh, let me try Ashish, if you turn your video off, that should help. If you turn your video off, Ashish, that should help with your connection. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Let me try sharing the screen. Yeah. Ah. Do I need to allow? Uh, yes. Okay, my apologies. I think I uh, sharing. Okay, while I'm uh, taking care of this, I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to essentially talk about uh, leveraging AI and ML for cybersecurity. Uh, technical and business challenges. I have only, you know, uh, 20 minutes, but how much time do I have, Nitin? Yeah, you uh, have. Less than that? Yeah, it's around uh, 10 minutes, which shows there, but yeah, you can take some 15 minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. So, you know, what I'm going to talk, um, essentially, uh, going to give a rundown um, uh, while I'm trying to, I'm in a MacBook, okay. And it's, uh, does it require me to share? Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to quickly uh, send this to, um, Nitin. Yeah, please, please do that, Ashish. We'll share it. Thank you. In the meanwhile, you can start your talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll share it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Okay, it's on the way to you, Nitin. Maybe in a half a minute it will be there. So, so today, if we took a look at cyber, right? Uh, uh, no. Cyber security, uh, no. Uh, essentially, there are uh, who who is essentially target the the threat. That's uh, who is carrying out uh, the kind of attacks, right? The attacks have evolved from individual users or individual attackers to group attackers. Uh, to state some sponsored ones, uh, okay, and then they have they have targeted uh, like for example SolarWinds kind of thing, uh, supply chain public set uh, public facing applications, um, okay, uh, and and uh, and that has resulted in ransomware for example new malware being uh, being uh, you know created for. Uh, um, you know, almost daily basis, there are hundreds of thousands of new malware being created. Um, let me pause here. I don't know why. Are you able to get it, uh, Nitin? Did you get the... Just checking. Have you sent it? Yeah, I've sent it. So it has not come till now. You can carry on, Ashish. In case I get it, I'll, I'll share it across. Uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, you can carry on with your presentation. Yeah. No issues. Okay. Uh, just give me one second. I'm sorry. My apologies. I don't know why. Just caught it, Ashish. We are sharing the presentation. So just carry on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, that's great. Now, so if you look at, uh, um, basically I'm on slide number four, you know, today's third group, right? Um, yeah, that's the one, thank you. So uh, if I'm going to, yeah, so if you look at uh, today's threat groups, right? The threat groups have evolved from single actor to uh, group actors, and they have resulted in highly advanced uh, supply chain attacks, for example, solar winds attack. Um, uh, they have also resulted in pipe the, the oil and gas pipeline attacks in the US, right? Uh, there would be in future, uh, there are some cryptocurrency attacks, but uh, uh, brace for some time. There will be cryptocurrency related attacks pretty soon. Um, of course, crypto jacking has, is already there out there. Um, so uh, now, when you talk of all these kind of uh, evolving threats, there are uh, several challenges in managing cybersecurity. This is a, this is a, um, uh, a sort of insights from Deloitte. And uh, they, they talk about rapid IT changes and rising complexities, pandemic, of course. Uh, pandem pandemic business continuity is one of the challenges that CISOs are facing. Uh, then there are difficulty in prioritizing different options, right? Uh, uh, and because the enterprise is not a, a, a monolithic enterprise anymore, it is an enterprise that is that spreads beyond uh, uh, global perimeter, even to um, uh, low Earth orbit satellites today, right? So therefore, um, it's the, the security landscape and the attack surface is, is pretty huge, distributed, and uh, geographically um, are diverse, right? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Now, if we if you look at uh, AI, let's pause from security for now. We are going to talk about AI for cyber security and challenges, right? Look at the future of AI. This is this is a uh, slide that I got from uh, Statista, right? <clears throat> and they talk about uh, that AI contributing to prevention against cybersecurity threats that will be about 2.5 billion dollars uh, by uh, 2025. I'm not sure. I think that is a bit uh, uh, lowballing the number. It will it's going to grow. Uh, much more than 2.5 billion dollars. The market is pretty huge already. However, one trend that we should look here is that security and AI together are at the bottom of that list. Okay, 
you know if you look at uh, ai for image recognition uh, computer vision predictive maintenance uh, that is industrial um, uh, 4.0 or industry 4.0 or something right all of them are you know ahead of uh, security threats and that that is that brings out one of the important point that it is not easy it is not going to be easy to apply ai or to use ai for security uh, defenses okay um, next slide please now <clears throat> however if you look at uh, this this slide could be a bit dated it's a um and and sometime back i got this slide right um, there are there are several companies say talks about 80 plus companies right uh, but there are several more than 80 startups today which are using ai for cyber security you know you look at anti fraud and identity management predictive intelligence uh, that includes you know behavioral analytics uh, um you know uba user behavior, user behavior analytics insider threats uh, anomaly detection automated security cyber risk management all of them right um then app security iot security and edge security is an extremely important one bar cognition is there um, and uh, deception security cyber fog uh, is there so all, all of these um, uh, startups right are are actually focusing on very specific you know primarily and then try to trying to address them with ai if we, if if there is a platform or there is a system that tries to address a boil the ocean right with ai uh, it should always look at the look at that as with a uh, with a pinch of salt you know because ai today is highly focused you know because the data need to be curated accordingly and it's it's supervised machine learning primarily it is not unsupervised machine learning right the next slide please now since we talked about data right and ai today which will go into essentially machine learning right depends on data without data you cannot talk about machine learning right? and if we uh, if we uh, quote spark right i i hope all of you guys know spark right he he is a professor at pardew and uh, is uh, one of the most well known figures in uh, technical world um in security you know and was actually um was my professor also at pardew uh, so he talked about the data does not data does not always mean information and uh, and information does not always lead to knowledge right and knowledge does not always lead to truth and wisdom what that means is that if you look at intelligence right forget about artificial intelligence if you talk about nat- natural intelligence right intelligence always tries to glean from the data from the data it receives glean information and from that information it tries to gain knowledge and uses that knowledge to generate more knowledge or apply it to carry out uh, decisions carry out monitoring carry out detection decisions right and manage uh, anything what it does right so so that is why data and knowledge are so important next slide please and and with respect to security right the knowledge many times you uh, know um, could be used but truth is about intent of the party right whether a, whether a, whether a party or whether a, whether a user is an attacker okay or is a potential threat versus it is a it is a benign legitimate user right how do you know that intent you know? and that intent would require understanding uh, you know something beyond knowledge and that that's so since data is so since machine learning is highly dependent on data right there and data does not lead to understanding or discovering intent of a party therefore it would be it is uh, it is hard if not impossible uh, to discover intent of a party using machine learning you know from data right? so then that is that is a there is a there is a open problem there is a biggest challenge how do you determine who is an attacker versus who is not an attacker whether a given given action by a user is is due to a bug or due to a vulnerability right 
and then um, so I'm I'm stretching this uh, code from Spark to security here, and and um, but that's what it is. You know, data cannot always be used. Machine learning cannot always always be used to um, to put a clear boundary between uh, between legitimate users and threat actors. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about intent, value, and assumptions. We can go to uh, please continue. So so here I'm going to talk about you know that what are you going to attack and who who what do you protect and from whom right? Who is the attacker and what are you protecting? Many times you know if you are if you are a human being, if you are an expert, or if you're an experienced security um, engineer, right? You will be able to identify oh, this seems to be an attack, right? When you are doing threat hunting, right, or you are when you are trying to find vulnerabilities in your code or system configuration, or in or um, uh, or, or in your architecture, right? But when you uh, when you want to apply AI, then you need to level the data sets, right? And you want to label them saying that oh, this is this is an attacker, this is not an attacker, or this is a this is a this is an attack, this is not an attack. Okay, or this is part of a multi-stage attack. This is not, uh, and and which stage it is, you know, very hard, right? It is it is a game. It is a game between attackers and, and the, the red team and blue team, or the attackers and the and the uh, defenders, right? Red team, I'm sorry. Red team means not necessarily attackers. Red team means the penetration testers and and uh, uh, kind of the the ethical hackers, kind of. Thing. Right. So, so therefore. Whether it is a uses or it is a failure or an attack, you know, uh, and that is a core challenge. We we often forget um, forget about this core fundamental challenge that we have, and try to uh, get swayed by buzzwords and and the millions of dollars that come in funding from uh, venture capitalists to the startups, right? And that is where they make a mistake. Next, next slide, please. And that is where they may start making assumptions because they have to drive, develop a product. There are there are teams, technical teams. They have to uh, even not in a startup, even in mature companies, they have to develop a product because there is that is their goal, right? And and uh, if it's a security product, let's say anomaly detection or, or or threat hunting, right? They are going to make assumptions about the intent, you know. And and uh, drawing that line, and there is no formal mechanism of drawing where that perimeter lies about uh, you know where, what the intent is, you know, and how the value, what the value of the target system, what their goals are. Next slide, please. Uh, so so uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, let's let's continue. I have the full slide. I'm sorry. I'm too. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you. So, so if you look at the trend in cybersecurity, right? We have, we have been using classical security uh, processes and mechanisms. We have we moved to data-driven security uh, over the last uh, about uh, maybe 10 years or uh, 15 years. Uh, Qradar and uh, um, Google, IBM uh, were the front runners. Cisco, of course, has been a front runner in in security. Data-driven security, and and now, over last few years, it has been about AI-driven security. It is hard to formalize to what, you know, how how and to do AI-driven security. Um, uh, it is learning-based. It will be probabilistic, um, and and we have to determine what features are we are we going to train upon. Where where are the data, and where are the policies? Are we going to use um, AI, or are you going to use neuromorphic AI? Um, uh, and then what kind of supervised or unsupervised machine learning, etc. Right? Um, and then there have been work on CM, ML-based CM, DDoS protection um, using ML, ML-based malware detection, malware containment. There has been some work. Um, I've worked on some of them. Incident management using AI and threat hunting using AI. Right? And there are, I haven't talked about identity management. Um, vulnerability analysis, etc. Yeah, you know, it's like um, there's not much time. 
let's continue on to the next slide please so so i'm i'm you know the, the simplified security process from a niche one i follow primarily is uh, m4 security process right monitor measure mitigate and manage right you can you monitor a system right whether you are doing uh, code analysis or you are uh, monitoring a system for uh, for uh, network packets you know in a, using ids or whatever um, then you measure right by measuring you will know what the risk whether they are um, uh, threat actors whether they are attack vectors or something and based on that measurement we, have, we carry out mitigation right i'm not talking about here building an architecture of course building the architecture building the system appropriately or design would be very helpful um, that's part of the mitigation as well you know? and manage right incident management um, uh, threat management even managing reporting uh, when there are incidents to to specific authorities government and and users and other authorities is part of this right the, the m4 security process if you look at that where will you apply ai for the uh, you know for most roi okay where is your return on investment on ai is going to give the uh, most bang for the buck okay. and and that is where firms uh, uh, part of monitoring you know uh, or or is it is it mitigation Right, or measurement or manage that we cannot make a black and white choice here right now we have to look at what is a specific workload that you are protecting you know what is the context of the of the security process that you are implementing is it enterprise is it industrial is it autonomous cars um, are we prot protecting against quantum threats um, or 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 what not right so so therefore uh, we can apply ai to one each of them or a combination of them right to have a more holistic approach to security but uh, but that requires careful uh, careful understanding or where we apply and then you look at monitoring and there are there's a huge tree underneath on how to monitor right. okay, next slide please and next slide yeah so so when we talk about ai for cyber uh, cyber security and the challenges right Uh, just just an overview i already have talked about it but ai at a highest level uh, not 10000 feet level right there are supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques there are shallow and deep uh, learning techniques right? so determining which ones will apply to home you know requires an ai engineer in your team okay or in the corresponding teams to or a set of ai team members to talk to the security engineers if you have security plus ai in the skill sets of the corresponding engineers that's awesome you are lucky to have these guys but but they are not that many of them even there are people who call themselves as ai uh, folks but they are not ai folks they are applied ai folks so uh, so so it's sometimes you need to develop new algorithms or modify existing algorithms uh, you know for example deep neural net you know existing neural net architecture may not work there you know you have to define a new neural net architecture based on the kind of data that you have um based on the um kind of features that you are going to train up on uh, all those things right so um, uh, next slide please of course it's a great opportunity as we have found out and talked about right there are traditional data driven approaches that held humans have uh, cannot really the scale is not is so much that nowadays we cannot use human beings for security anymore completely they provide an integrated cover and holistic view 360 degree view and protection um the attack surface is used so they protect against many attack surfaces they extract latent features then perhaps they provide more lat latency i cannot talk about throughput but perhaps they provide more latency right but there are accuracy issues and next slide please so so given given this background right we are currently in the world of like if i if i have if i have three levels like in autonomous driving there are five levels right or six levels l0 to l5 um um 
Similarly, here I like to simplify it, make it three levels, right? Semi L0, um, you know, or four levels, which doesn't use AI at all. And then there are uh, there are semi autonomous security, uh, there is human assisted AI for security, and there is autonomous security. Autonomous security doesn't require any any uh, assistance from human beings or anything else, you know. They are going to continue to protect the system um, uh, with with high level of accuracy as needed, right? And that is what that is a that is a bit further away, right? Um, we are in this phase of like you know L1 and L2 kind of semi-autonomous security and human-assisted AI for security. Human-assisted AI for security is primarily for um, you know being used today for these um, uh, security operation centers and, and incident management systems. There, there you have, you have 100 alerts. You using AI determine what the top alerts are, you know, top five alerts or top three alerts, and figure that out. Go and go and address them, right? And semi-autonomous security is where you use certain rules, certain policies. Um, you use classical security and AI-based security, some data-driven security, all of them together to drive certain uh, capabilities. Next slide, please. So, so, so to achieve these these um, four layers or four different phases of uh, autonomy and security using AI, right? There are key one key challenge that we have already talked about is data, right? If you delve down, then the quality of data is extremely important. Where do you get the where do you get the data? Who will give you the uh, of the uh, uh, logs? You know, of uh, of an enterprise being compromised. Okay, there you are, right? Uh, um, uh, and and so therefore there are private data islands. There are data islands due to regulatory requirements, right? And then uh, then there are encrypted data, right? Deep packet and inspection fails primarily at the IPS IDS layer because um, most of our traffic today is uh, encrypted. And therefore, there's a, there's, a, there's a dark web there for security. And then data poisoning, you know, you cannot, how can you trust the data? Right? Uh, there could be the data could be poisoned. Right? Um, and on top of that, something that is new that we have to, uh, I worked on earlier is uh, on suitable machine learning is fraudulent machine learning, right? Machine learning could be fraudulent. Your AI, pro, AI service provider could say they're going to classify everything correctly for you. They are training things correctly for you for anomaly detection or, or uh, authentication uh, inside our threats, but they have not trained, their, trained, trained the systems appropriately. They have just trained it for last few year, few hours where the training takes several days. And then they say oh, the model is ready because they have to start producing money uh, for their venture capitalists or for their investors or shareholders, right? And that is exactly that what happens, right? And that is your CISOs the next are on the line, right? They have to listen to the business uh, decision makers and they have to look at technical uh, decision makers. Okay, next slide, please. I think uh, I, I, I do not have enough time. Hello. I'm going to uh, 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 drop a few of them. Hello. Uh, yes, so let's yeah. go to the last slide, CISO. Hello, yes. Yeah, let's let's stay in that, in that uh, uh, CISO slide, please. There's a figure there. Yeah, right here. Okay, so if you look at this one, right, uh, uh, the 2021 global CISO radar for by Webstorm, right? Look at the kind of requirements that are there. Right? Especially uh, in today's world, right? You look at the pandemic business continuity, very hard. You look at my, you know, I if I if my network is working, I cannot share properly. Right now, my my video conferencing channel could be uh, could be told to be encrypted, but it's not end to end encrypted. Uh, there are uh, vulnerabilities there. Then, then you look at cloud and everything, or post quantum crypto. Uh, all of these things, right, are uh, you know, increasing the attack surface with the increase in IoT device and edge devices, as we talked previously, uh, right? Sachin talked about that. Uh, so, so um, the challenges. There are technical challenges. There are challenges uh, from the business side, and there are challenges for CISOs, right? There are so many things on the radar. Many times the CISOs are not equipped for um, uh, for AI kind of uh, uh, background, right? 
uh, not because they have been working uh, for a long number of years now and maybe they have taken some uh, courses etc to be honest right and they are not the uh, the best ai experts in the in the group so so therefore when they have to make a decision right they have to rely upon the team that they have to say that what is what, what is a good ai based system or not and it's very hard let's go to the next slide please just uh, the, the, the last yeah how do you validate a system right how do you validate a system how do you validate the data set that was used for that system right will will the uh, suppose you are selling a ml based system for um, for insider threats right would you share the data set with the with your customer no right many times no uh, sometimes if yes then how do you validate the correctness authenticity of the data set right how do you validate that system from a ciso's point of view anyway i think let's go to the last slide please just to conclude yeah um, that we talked about ai for cyber is a great opportunity there are several however there are several technical challenges um, business challenges and also legal challenges i have not gone into ai ethics related challenges in cyber security for AI, with ai uh, but but that is um, that is there and and uh, um, so ai for cyber can make life of ciso easier can make also hard uh thank you for the next slide any questions ryan i'm sorry i took some time and also there are some you know couldn't share my screen but really appreciate thank you uh thank you ashish thank you for the presentation and i know it was very informative and with a lot of uh, great information on the slides i know there were some technical challenges but yeah that's how the virtual world is thank you thank you ashish for the lovely presentation See you soon. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, guys, we'll quickly move on to Andre. Andre Walls, who is EVP, Chief Information Security Officer, Customers Bank. Andre, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So, Andre's topic is threat intelligence, making AI relevant. Over to you, Andre. Awesome. Thank you. Just gonna bring up my uh, my deck here. Sorry about that. Okay, and I just need to figure out how to get. So there is a slideshow there. Slideshow just uh, in the toolbar. Okay, yeah. Like that. Is that? Can you see that correctly? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you everyone for uh, for joining me. Um, I'm gonna be talking about threat intelligence and making artificial intelligence relevant to threat intelligence. Um, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time defining what threat intelligence means um, for your security organization. And then how, what's the right way for us to apply artificial intelligence to the threat intel discipline? And I think most importantly, how to prevent from over applying artificial intelligence um, to threat intel. So uh, just a, a brief overview on, on myself. My name is Andre Giroux Walls. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer for Customers Bank Corp and Customers Bank. We are a $20 billion super regional uh, financial institution that focuses uh, mainly on commercial um, and, and small business, but we also have a consumer arm. Uh, we have a few million customers. We were one of the leading banks during uh, the uh, PPP um, um, loan period in lending, uh, and, and we kept a lot of businesses open uh, that were on the smaller side because we issued a lot of smaller loans uh, to, to smaller American businesses. Very proud to have been part of that effort, and we recently came out with, uh, with our, our earnings uh, for this quarter, which um, bested uh, any earnings that the companies had in history. So we are growing, we're thriving. Um, and one of the reasons for that, I believe, is, is because we have a organization-wide focus on information security and cybersecurity and ensuring that that discipline is, uh, is leveraged throughout the organization. So when we talk about threat intelligence, um, you know, threat intelligence is 
a magnifying glass, right? Um, I, I think it is very important to look at threat intelligence from that lens to to be able to say to yourselves, you know, we're 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 leveraging threat intelligence to provide magnification of things that we already know, um, things that we um, I, I guess you could say think we know. Um, and and what we know about our environment, uh, the things that we don't know about the different mechanisms and indicators um, that go into um, how your adversaries are trying to work against you, where those risks exist, your actors, your methods, their modalities. Um, and, and all of these things are, are very important for us to be able to um, to to glean um, into how they might apply to you. And this is the context. So threat intelligence that doesn't provide you with context is, is pretty useless threat intelligence. Um, and then what you are able to do about it, the action ability. That's what good threat intelligence is. There are three general types of threat intelligence for us to think about. Strategic intelligence uh, is often a non-technical view of the threat landscape to a business. And not all threats have a cyber genesis, but have a cyber impact. So let me say that again. Not all threats have a cyber genesis, but have a cyber impact. You can have threats that don't start cyber at all and end up with a demonstrable cyber impact. Um, things like business email compromise tend to start from the social channel. So it's important to have threat intelligence that pays attention to social channels like LinkedIn um, and, and even Facebook, believe it or not, which is not supposed to be a, a professional thing, uh, but people do leverage it. Companies do leverage Facebook um, and, and other social media. And a lot of times uh, we're starting to see in the intelligence that we do for our own executives and for, for our team members inside of the bank, you know, vishing is starting to become a major channel for threat actors where they pretend to be an executive or they pretend to be the media um, or, you know, a company offering someone an award is something we saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they will place a phone call to an individual and pretend to be this person. That's not a cyber genesis. Threat intelligence, we have to make sure that we pay attention to everything, including the things that don't necessarily start on a computer. And when we talk about that strategic intelligence, this is the stuff that we're delivering to our, our boards, to the executives inside of our organization, and to our line managers who need to know what their employees might face. The tactical intelligence is stuff that we're used to, right? We hear about this most, most often, and that would be the tactics, techniques, and procedures of threat actors and collaboration sources, generally your red team exercises, right? Um, gamification of the threat landscape, usually aligned to business practices, products, and technology. So this is where we try to figure out what our adversaries are going to do and how they're going to do it. We generate scenarios and use cases, and we try to game against those. And then, of course, operational intelligence is where we do research insights into existing attacks, events, or campaigns that are already out there in the wild or have been um, discovered as a result of issues that have already been seen. Uh, in 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 de various products. This provides work for incident response teams to understand nature, timing, and intent of specific attacks. So when we look at AI's purpose, AI's purpose in the threat intelligence space is to improve, not to replace. I think one of the mistakes that modern security teams make is they think they can implement a system. I'm not going to drop any names, but they think they can implement a system that essentially, you know, provides all of their threat intelligence and they'll get a bright red alarm um, that, that tells them, hey, something's going on and here's something for you to pay attention to. And they'll be able to drive the team towards paying attention to it or worse, people believe that they can implement SOAR and reduce the footprint that they have for their security organization uh, in place of using computers that will just magically, what I like to call automagically, do it all for you. This isn't reality. Um, AI's purpose in this space is to improve, not to replace. When we talk about threat intelligence being the magnifying glass, 
AI really should provide um, the, the additional levels of magnification from down to you know, that spot level where we can clearly identify something as a threat or something is not a threat, um, or the macro level where we can see anomalies against the baseline. The important thing here is that you know, these established baselines are supposed to make anomalies clear, which means that AI provides you with enhancement of your threat intelligence over time. The longer you have it in place, the more you invest in terms of data and ensuring that that data is of a consistently high quality, the better AI will do for you. When you first implement a system, the AI is not going to be able to tell you good versus bad. And when we talk about intelligence in general, we're saying that intelligence is all about drawing baselines from everyday operation of technology. The longer that baseline, the more glaring an anomaly becomes. AI can enhance this, but we should call this machine learning. The computer needs assistance to coordinate what it sees as different because good versus bad isn't necessarily or naturally determined by an AI system. The human factor is why AI cannot completely replace and automate cybersecurity. Somebody has to help the computer decide for good from bad, anomaly from planned activity or expected behavior. AI can enable more perfect data modeling and ontologies. And when we talk about ontologies, those are categories of entities based on their names, relationships, properties, et cetera, making them easier to sort into hierarchies or sets. Remember that artificial intelligence or machine learning in this space um, is, is going to be effective against the ontologies that we give it because that's how it detects anomalies against those patterns. Um, impossible travel, for example, is a perfect example of leveraging series of ontologies to create events that then allow AI to be able to raise a flag and say something's wrong. So when you have a, a person log in from Chicago, the login in terms of geography says they're logging in from Chicago, Illinois. And it also says that the time zone that they're currently in is the central time zone. And let's say, for example, it's 10 a.m. there when they log in. The login is good because the password was accepted, the username was accepted. And so from an AI's perspective, this was a good event. The same person goes to log in to that system a half an hour later from Los Angeles, California. And the AI is going to say, okay, hold on. Los Angeles, California, different time zone a geography that someone could not travel to within a half an hour, there's a problem here. But it takes data over time in order to build that kind of ontology. And so it is on us as the practitioners to ensure that we're feeding solid data into these systems. And one of the reasons why um, I think it's important to go as deep as you're able to go inside of your organization when it comes to categorization of of, of data, the type of data that it is, the system that it's attached to, leveraging things like time and time zones, leveraging things like geography, um, even job role, and breaking those down into various categories helps AI achieve the purpose of improving and not replacing and take some of the guesswork off of your sock, having to figure out what's good and what's not good. And it also helps, and I think this is probably the most important point with forecasting. Once your data set has gotten large enough, you can now start to forecast attacks. You can start to see precursors to attacks. And this is one of the things that allows you to get into a proactive space with, with something that's, that's supposed to be proactive from the beginning, and that's threat intelligence, supposed to be proactive, right? For the most part, we try to um, reduce the possibility for an attack to turn into an incident by being as predictive as possible with the intentions of the adversary and where they're trying to go and what they're trying to do before they're even able to have any success or perform the kind of reconnaissance that could lead to success later. So forecasting becomes very, very important. And I I forgot to mention uh, about classification of events and entities which aids in prioritization, because of course prioritization is important. Um, I can tell you that my security operations team 
deals with around 300,000 events in any given day. And so um, what we have to be able to do, obviously, is prioritize those events to try and figure out, okay, which of these events have the greatest impact? We risk rate them. And then we leverage our AI platform to help us in that risk rating determine how deep would someone be able to go in those instances? Um, and, and what sorts of controls do we need to put in place or things do we need to change uh, in, in order to prevent that attack from going any further? And I will say that you know the other advantage to prioritization is it keeps your people with you longer. I think when you have a system that supports a workflow where people don't feel flustered because information is organized and put in front of them in a rational and purposeful way, it's easier to keep your people with you. And these days um, where we have sort of the great migration of employees from company to company, it becomes extremely important to have systems that help people feel like everything's not on fire <laughs> and, and, and there's a, a, an ability for them to organize their day uh, so that they don't feel drained uh, or, or drawn out. And that is one of the really good uses of AI to be able to take some of that legwork um, and, and make things simpler. Integration is extremely key. Uh, this, is, this should be obvious. Leveraging AI for incident response can enable analysts to identify and dismiss false positives, which improves the effectiveness of the AI over time, because now we can start to flag and say, this is a false positive and here's why. Analysts should be positioned to provide near real-time context to define risks and compare information from internal and external sources that are deemed valid. It would take a human days to do what a computer can do in minutes. And, and we know this, we've been saying this for our entire careers. I think it's a very um, obvious conclusion for a practitioner to, to draw. What I will say when we talk about integration is the importance of being able to maintain consistent audit trails that allow you to do back in modeling. You do have to take the time to check your threat intelligence every once in a while to ensure that you haven't oversimplified the model or gotten yourself into a place where everything seems like a false positive and you're missing good nuggets of information. And so back in modeling, taking the time on a, you know, we do it on a quarterly basis where we, where we audit our own model, um, but being able to go back and make sure that your model is presenting you with good success, good success factors in your threat intelligence is very, very, very important. And when, and the context when we're talking about threat intelligence here, this isn't the, um, oh, um, um, IBM came out with an alert and said, these are the IOCs and these are the things that threat actors are doing. That's not threat intelligence, that's news. Threat intelligence is relevant only to your business. You're taking the time to take that information that you got from IBM and you're leveraging it in your own systems to figure out, okay, where does this apply to us? How do we prioritize this against the things that we have in our environment? How do we take our analysts and be able to give them the information they need to be able to see, okay, do we have an obfuscation attack in place where someone's pretending to do one thing when they're actually doing something else? How do we take this news that exists all over the place, which is not threat intelligence, and turn it into intelligence for our business? because threat intelligence is directly associated to your business. It's never generalized. So even if there's a worm that's going on out there throughout the entire financial industry and hundreds of banks are seeing IOCs and everything else, that doesn't make it intelligence for you. It becomes intelligence for you when you've assessed your risk relative to that worm based on how your infrastructure is set up, the protections that you have in place, the mitigants that you have in place and the controls and processes that you have in place to be able to detect what's going on there. Um, integration into your vulnerability management program. And this is the other thing that threat intelligence should do for you. It should help with vulnerability management. We can't just pay attention to CVSS scores anymore, right? Um, I think everyone's learning the lesson about vulnerabilities that are traditionally rated medium. 
they represent low hanging fruit for threat actors. And so if your only focus in your vulnerability management program is patching highs and criticals, you've missed 70% of, of the risk for your organization. Um, and it is important to leverage a threat intelligence program to help you prioritize medium risks, you know, things that are defined as medium, um, and be able to take those, those risks and apply them in a prioritized way to seal up holes and issues in the infrastructure before they can become events for you. And threat intelligence can not only help you determine whether or not those things have already gotten on the road to exploit through, um, through reconnaissance, but I think more importantly, can help you close the gap on connective tissue that you might not have known was there between two otherwise disparate systems that become critical once you put them together. And that's where AI can help. So, you know, again, I don't want to throw out any product names, but there are products out there um, that can help with crawling through your infrastructure and being able to figure out if this vulnerability with these IOCs were present in your environment, these two systems who don't necessarily talk to each other in this instance would be able to or would be leveraged in that way through lateral movement in order to create issues in your infrastructure. And a threat intelligence program that leverages that sort of you know, network and infrastructure based AI against all of the other back end systems that you have against the news feeds that you receive from outside and the intelligence that you already have in your sock. You put those things together and now you've got a real discipline and a real system that is integrated and gives you intelligence across the entire enterprise to be proactive because proactive security is 10 times cheaper than reactive. So I just waxed poetic about this entire thing, um, but thank you for your time. I'm interested to know if anyone has any questions or if there's anywhere that I can dive in deeper for you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for the lovely presentation and giving an insight. And anyway, audience can connect with you on the LinkedIn. Yeah, I think yes. you are active on LinkedIn and uh, it's the best way nowadays yes. to connect. Yeah. And thanks for the lovely presentation and uh, giving an insight into uh, into your topic, like how what what how is AI becoming relevant? What is the threat intelligence which has to be adopted? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Andre. So, guys, we'll quickly move on. I know we are late, around twenty minutes. So, uh, we have the last panel discussion, which uh, in which Rex Johnson is the moderator. He's the director and practice leader, CAI Cybersecurity. Then we have Nathan, who is Chief Security Strategist at Teenable. And we have Sandeep Grover, who is VP Information Technology at Empire Communities. So over to you, Rex, quickly, and let's try to make this panel discussion an interesting one. Thank you. Over to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today. And uh, Nathan and Sandeep, uh, obviously, you guys uh, are here to talk about uh, how artificial intelligence and cyber... Oops, I think we lost Rex. Oh, so we might have lost Rex. It's, it's uh, very, uh, very important as we. Technology. I. Rex, try that one more time. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, gentlemen, uh, thanks again. I have a little bit of intermittent. I am in a hotel, so I am relying on their Wi Fi. So, uh, not the two. Uh, gigabit one that I have at home. But uh, so uh, we'll dive into the questions here. And what I'd like to do is uh, I'll give you each a chance to, to answer each one. Tell me how you see organizations engaging artificial intelligence as part of their own cybersecurity defenses. And Nathan, we'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Bert. So, I, I mean, I think a lot of it's been covered already, but the key that we're seeing for artificial intelligence and cybersecurity really is around automation. It's it's helping to uh, be kind of a, a level set in the playing field for a lot of organizations, right? Where we're taking uh, tasks that historically have been done manually, uh, whether that's reviewing the number of uh, attacks in your organization or the number of events that are taking place or trying to correlate that data. A lot of this has been done just by humans over the years. And 
the, the way that we see the attacks growing, it simply isn't scalable. Right? We, we can't keep up with the volume of attacks, the speed at which they come. So AI right now, I see being most leveraged in that way. And, and obviously various types of cybersecurity and diff- different disciplines. But the goal really is, can we automate some of these processes and start to scale up how we analyze and process data uh, with the ultimate goal to feed it back to the humans to make smarter decisions about how do we mitigate, do we mitigate at all <laughs> in some cases, uh, where do you go next? Very good. I'll just quickly add on to that as well. I mean, I think the risk of going last on a four-hour event is that everything that you wanted to say has been said before by several people. So the risk of repeating several others and Nathan yourself, I'll say I think the biggest thing that we've driven AI in the businesses, particularly I've, I've come from healthcare, I'm GE Healthcare and some of the other sophisticated businesses where, you know, events were and incidents were big deals. So incident diagnostics is the biggest thing that I think we've seen where out of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of events and incidents in a day, how do you, you know, get to a very close set of um, events that you want to be focusing and honing it on to be able to drive some pattern recognition so that th- those are the ones that humans will look at. I think um, we all know that, you know, AI is going to help us with a lot of the automation of monitoring of these tools, but it's very important that ultimately they come in the hands of human beings so that we can take an action on it. Because, you know, what AI is going to do is going to isolate that and in most cases going to prevent it from expanding. But the actual um, determination of, you know, what that does to the networks and, and what needs to be happened to be treated ultimately remains in the hands of humans. And which is why I think your last, uh, you know, your points around AI cannot stay on its own. I think it has to have a human element to it to be able to control it and, and effectively mitigate it. And that's how the majority of our businesses have taken advantage of it. Now, those are some excellent thoughts. You're exactly right. Uh, the human element does not go away. We're, we're not at a stage uh, that we're going to see uh the for those of you who are Star Trek fans, Commander Data is walking around who can reason uh, based on their artificial intelligence. There's still going to need to be a human element that that takes that and 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 plays a role in that. But let's talk a little bit about some of the human factors that we have. We know social engineering is a challenge, and everybody will tell you the human is the weakest link. We talk about the insider threat, but another thing that humans have is they have a little bit of apprehension. And they may not really see AI as something they can trust at this time. So as you have seen this, especially in the world of providing uh, a better solution to folks, and we'll start with you, Sandeep, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the apprehensions you're seeing uh, from people uh, as AI is being adopted. And I think uh, just on the, again, on the, the risk of repeating some of the others have said, AI is available to the bad guys as well, as much it is available to us. So I think some of the things we've talked about as very unsophisticated, simple attacks like JavaScript attacks and botnet attacks, these things Mm -hmm. can very potentially and very um, significantly use AI as a mechanism. I think that remains the biggest apprehension that some of the things we've talked about earlier, like poisoning of the data. Because, Because AI feeds on large amount of data, Anytime a bad guy wants to inject a poisonous data into the data set, we are feeding our AI networks that wrong information. And now we're, now we're training our AIs to really react to something which, is a, which could be a false positive and false negative. I think that remains the number one challenge. But if you keep adding on top of that, um, evasion attacks and Trojan AI attacks and impersonalization attacks, are those techniques available to... Um, the bad guys and hackers as well to be able to inject that those into our data sets, into our algorithms in a way that it's going to negatively negatively impact, um, you know, the algorithms. And I think that by itself is a huge element of why there hasn't been a real uptick. And I say that a lot of people get upset at that comment, right? Because really, I think conceptually we all get it that AI is a big deal and it can really potentially you know, get us, accelerate us in our um, defense and fight against cyber. However, I don't think that there are big comprehensive tools available that can handle majority of the data as well as 
um, for small and medium businesses particularly, I think there remains a, a big gap in terms of comprehensive tools that can be plug and play or can be adopted very quickly. That's the second challenge. And I think number three is educating the senior leadership, the advantages and how that it helps because it takes significant amount of people, which is hard to find, and investment, which is also hard to find in a publicly traded organizations and industrial organizations. So educating the senior leadership to be able to invest into this and drive um, the resolution of the items that we are working on every day continues to be, I think, my top three challenges, I would say. Okay. Nathan, uh, same question for you. Uh, what apprehensions are you seeing uh, in the adoption of artificial intelligence? Well, I, think, I mean, I want to step back away from a little bit of sort of the, the practical advice that Sandeep's giving, which, again, I agree. But I, there's a social consideration here that, that I think it's overlooked a lot of cases about this. I mean, to me, the word apprehension is a feeling. Right. It's an emotional kind of response. And we are dealing with people here, so we have to address that. And there's two sides to this that I see very commonly when I talk to organizations and, you know, interview staff and try to pull together kind of advice about these sorts of things. One is, I guess on one side of it is we have kind of a false expectation in a lot of ways in the industry about what AI is and can do. And it's not just about inter, um, educating senior leaders. It's really educating everyone. And vendors, of which, you know, I work for one, so in full disclosure, um, are just as guilty about this as anyone else. I mean, any of you who have been to the RSA conference in the last five years knows perfectly well that the letters A and I are on half the booths and all the marketing slogans. Pretty much. But everyone. if you talk to them, they're not really doing AI. Right. They might be doing some data analytics. They might be doing some bare bones kind of data processing, but it's not really what we would consider to be AI. You couple that with the kind of weird expectation, like you're saying, Rex, where people think that AI is the science fiction version. It's Skynet, it's you know self-thinking androids, and so they have this notion that, oh, if I buy AI, it'll just do all my work for me. Problem solved, right? Environment secured, it's a silver bullet, everything's done. So we've created this expectation that isn't valid, and I think we, we have to almost step back away from the senior leadership. We really have to do better as an industry to talk about what it is, be clear about what it isn't, uh, and get the expectations back in line because that is going to resolve a lot of the apprehension. It also, sorry to go on, but that second half of the Please. apprehension is the workers. It's the people in cybersecurity who I hear on a daily basis saying, well, I don't want to lose my job because I'll be replaced by a machine. Right. Well, right, because they have a different expectation of what that, that tool is going to do for you. Uh, Andre, just before us, I mean, I think he said it best, right? It, it's got it's an it's an empowerment tool for your your staff. It's a way to make them be focused on what you hired them to do. If I have a team of really expensive people that I spend a lot of time finding, I don't want them managing Excel spreadsheets full of data and trying to find the needle in a haystack on you know massive rows of text. I want to make them uh, reach their value. Mm -hmm. by giving them the top 10 problems. And if AI can, sh can surface that, great, and have them go be effective at those really challenging risks that my organization faces. So we have to do a better job of this communication of setting the understanding of what it is and isn't. And I think that's where you're going to see the apprehension start to, to fall away from kind of all sides of the equation. And I think you very well said the augmented part is important. Mm -hmm. I think AI must might as well be called augmented intelligence because it's I, really augmenting human beings to make better decisions. And I totally I, agree. Sorry, Rex, I'll take one more minute. I think it's important. Please go ahead. I have to sit, get it out. I, I think it's you very well said our expectations as industry has been very falsely led. Much like I'm going to throw out a couple of terms here, which people thought is going to solve the world problems and world hunger, like big data. It's a big thing out there. Conceptually, mm -hmm. very, very valuable. But Practically, you know, you question how real has it been over the last few years. IoT, um, and everybody, all vendors pretty much use the marketing terms IoT and AI and, and uh, big data and analytics. And the reality is that AI, the way it differs from the other products and services is how cognitive it is. Like, What's the ability mm -hmm. for it to continuously learn? And I think a lot of vendors talk about AI as a, as a toolkit. It's not analytics alone. 
is the cognitive ability to continuously learn synchronously or asynchronously. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the product sets lack that synchronous cognitive ability to continuously sure. learn from the big data sets. It's very important for, uh, for CISOs to understand. Oh, and I agree. And, you know, if, if I can kind of give uh, somewhat of an analogy here, uh, if you take a look at uh, animation, uh, for example, the folks who started Pixar started at Disney and they said, we can do animation on computers. We don't have to write page by, by page and frame by frame. And even though you would think that makes my job so much easier, the artists panicked and thought their jobs were jeopardized because, my God, I got to learn how to use a different tool than a pen. And, and the people were fired. Of course, they went out and made – they were very successful. Disney later realized probably shouldn't have let these guys go, and they, they now work together with them. But it's an interesting thing that we see something like this that you would think would provide you to be able to do what you do better. So take a creative person and allow them to be more creative and do more movies per year uh, with a tool that automates a lot of their menial tasks. They resist it because they didn't understand that change. And I, I work with uh, several MDR and XDR providers that use the threat intelligence and AI to find near zero day attacks it, that they've been able to come and say, hey, we now recognize these patterns in another environment. And, and we can now tell them they're at risk where we know this because this happened before. So threat intelligence and AI working together uh, with the right tools can provide that, but sometimes there is that apprehension. And uh, I kind of want to take something that Sandeep took uh, and then uh, cover something really uh, scary, and that is how could threat actors use AI? And, and think about this. What could threat actors do? And uh, Sandeep, since you brought it up, we're going to start with you. How do you think uh, uh, a malicious actor could use AI? You talked a little bit about fuzzing and, and data yeah. overflow, but maybe some other ways that they could actually game this to their advantage, in your opinion. I, I think there's a few very well-known techniques that I'm going to quickly run through them, and I'm sure Nathan can add to it. But poisoning is something that worries me on top of the mind as well, right? Because of the data sets available to AI to learn on a, on a daily you know, or a, every second basis, a small subset of data, if poisoned accurately, could change the algorithms to think differently. And I think that's, that's the most important and most mm -hmm. relevant and significant risk to um, you know, data learning. The second thing that is very well um, articulated in some of the studies as, as well as the evasion attack where changing some of the pixelations on an image Humans naturally know this is an image. Like, I think I, don't, I can't remember who showed the image of the dog. I think it must, must have been um, one of the speakers. But humans know it's a dog and that's a ball. But AI, for AI to be able to learn the image and pixels, to be able to understand it's an image of a dog, it will only take 10% of the pixels to be changed on the image and converted into a cat, for example. So in, in sophisticated terms, it could be used as an evasion attack we are changing some of the pixelations and, or data sets could impersonate that data to be something else. Um, and, and, you know, Trojan AI, which is a, you know, a version from Trojan Bear, even at the very beginning, for organizations who are not using AI at this point, cannot buy data sets to learn. And it's going to take a long time. And that's where I think the biggest risk, are. that's where the threat actors could use the early stages of, AI learning to take advantage of the wrong, uh, you know, Trojan AI attack type of thing, where it's it's just irrelevant right from the get go. The data is, it's just irrelevant from the right get go. And, and the the thing with buying a lot of data sets to be able to train, it's not easily available. I think that was also said in some of the speaker presentations that you cannot buy data sets in a in an intellectual way, an ethical way to be able to train your AI. And that's why you have to spend the time to educate your own AI and you have to make sure that we take the time and, and feed the ethical amount of data. And I think that's where some of the threat actors could play a very significant role in, mm -hmm. in some of the uh, impacts, positive impacts of AI. 
That's that's fantastic. Uh, Nathan, same question. How do you think threat actors could use artificial intelligence to improve their odds uh, of a successful exploit? Well, I feel like we're going to have a, a bit of a pattern here now. Uh, I, I agree with Cindy, even, and I think those are you know, two really good examples. And I'm going to take it to a little bit more of the human side of it. Uh, you know, I, I think that the trend we've been seeing over the last probably, I, I'd argue, 20 years, a, as we've gotten better about securing technology, the old path of least resistance problem comes up and attackers keep moving to where they can more easily gain whatever they're trying to gain, intellectual property, finance, whatever. Um, so people have become attacked much more often. That's why we have phishing you know, emails grew over the last 10 years and ransomware attacks. We're going after the humans. And this is an area where AI for an attacker put it, you know, in their hands can be really powerful because uh, you're essentially taking the Facebook model, right. right? They do have massive amounts of data that we, the, the good guys, do not have. To your point, right. Sandeep, they have been for many, many years now stealing databases of information. Uh, and it's all out there on the, you know, the black market, dark web. The deep, deep prefer. web and dark web, yep. Uh, they have access mm-hmm. to all of this stuff, right? So... If I want to build a better social engineering engine, if I want to make my emails seem even more convincing, if I want to correlate who you mm-hmm. are and where you go and what you do and what you like and all the things, exactly like Facebook and some of the other big companies do with all the data they've collected about you, you have to kind of consider that all of those data breaches that have gone on, the attackers have that information. Right. Empowered by AI, they can be really devastating for social engineering attacks, which um, I think that's going to be kind of the next frontier in a lot of these ways. I mean, ransomware is still very effective, and you're going to see it continue against attacks in areas that aren't well protected, like OT environments, as we've been seeing. Correct. But when those get hardened, they're going to have to cloud. When cloud gets hardened, there's not a whole lot left at this point. They're going to go after people. And mm-hmm. it's those humans that we've got to really start to educate better about this because the the obvious tricks we've used to dismiss the phishing emails, oh, it's misspelled, talks about things that aren't relevant to you, those will go away. It's going to be very relevant. It's going to seem like it came from your parents you know, or your, your spouse. And, and it's going to be just nearly impossible for, for people to be able to disseminate the truth from reality of what the attack's coming at them. It's, and so... It's a, it's a really scary world, and that's the truth of it. But the attack that's these already tools and that's where it's going to go. Nathan, that's already happening. You know, the, it's getting so the phishing attempts are getting so sophisticated already. We see that it's not it's not humans doing on the other side. It's very well reading the patterns of your previous emails, looking at the people you've interacted mm-hmm. with, building a pattern, and creating an email or a, a message that seems very real. Some of the some of the very fine points of how, how people articulate things and how people salute salute things is becoming so real that you you want, want to believe that email you want to believe that message. Totally agree. It's a scaling, mm-hmm. right? We're we're starting to see the cusp of that data analysis, and I and I agree. And they're they're using that to their advantage. There's still easier paths that give them better rewards. So what what we see on our side, at least from a research perspective, the kind of AI backed phishing campaigns is still relatively small, but growing. Mm-hmm. And once it becomes the easiest path, it, this is going to be, I mean, a scale level is going to be a massive problem. You bring up a very good point. And one of the things I talk to a lot of my clients about is the amount of dwell time. Uh, I mean, you if you see the IBM Ponemon report, you're looking at 212 days before uh, a threat actor is even detected in the environment. And that varies. That's on average, of course. But what are they doing during that dwell time? They're learning. They're studying. And I have told organizations that they will figure out how your CEO uses their, how they write, how they capitalize, everything. And I said, exactly. threat actors are very good. They're very patient. Uh, they would make great teenagers uh, in high school because they study and they're patient and they take their time. Um uh, and I say that as a parent jokingly, but at the same time, uh, it's paying off for them. Uh, and so artificial intelligence can give them that advantage to even run that dwell time down because they could use that to their advantage to the points you you gentlemen have brought up. So it can be very scary in, in the wrong hands uh, and definitely something that uh, we need to, as 
cybersecurity professionals think about how to prevent. Because at the end of the day, the threat actors are no longer just doing this to be cool and uh, doing the Robin Hood to steal from the rich and give to the poor. They're doing it because it's big, it's profitable, and they're making money. And this is their career. And it's no longer for fun. It is a big payday. And they're going to continue to find ways. It's kind of in that... Kind of in that vein, if I may, gentlemen, I want to kind of shift the focus a little bit from the threat actors on AI to let's talk about some concerns that we might have with AI as it, we talk about things like privacy. Privacy has been huge. Uh, we have uh, GDPR that was implemented a few years ago. Uh, I don't think Google has paid that bill to the EU yet. Probably yes. will not. Um, and then you've got... Fighting it. <laughs> You got the CCPA. Uh, I happened to be in California. Uh, I was at a conference. Uh, I had a chance to hear CISA talk about some of the same things we talked about today. But uh, the CCPA is a big California thing for uh, for privacy and protection of that. So Facebook has faced it uh, with privacy issues. A uh, number of organizations have been concerned with that. We know in the healthcare industry, uh, once you reach uh, a, a breach of, of 500 records, you go on the uh, wall of shame for PHI. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of intelligence or personal identifiable information or PHI out there and, and other privacy matters. Right. So how do you think artificial intelligence is going to have to deal with privacy uh, and, and keeping compliance with that? And where are some challenges? Nathan, I'll go to you first. Sure. I, I mean... To some extent, we've kind of already covered most of this because it's getting into the sort of the, you know, how do you correlate and analyze all this giant trove of data that you might have? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen, I think, in this kind of situation is this is, this is again, where the humans are going to come in. There is no single right answer to this question. There, there may be for some industries, especially when it's regulated, all right, so they have some very, so like the healthcare industry, as you just mentioned. But at, at the end of the day, broadly, there is no single right answer. So everyone is going to have to kind of decide. What kind of data am I holding? How critical is it? What regulations do I fall under? What steps am I going to take to, to mitigate that? And when you start to make these business decisions around how do I handle risk and mitigate these things? What do I need to do about privacy? Again, AI can be an augmentation to your processes to empower you to execute. If you want to be monitoring your network better to see if data is moving around in ways that it shouldn't, AI is a really good use of that kind of, of, of monitoring and analysis of what's happening. You're trying to understand access control and who's taking data in and out at weird times. It's sort of the, the old user behavioral analysis thing. Again, that automated empowerment of taking something that can do it on its own, can scale, can be very fast, and can do more than you know a, a, a poor human sitting there trying to read through logs can do. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's an empowerment there to help enforce the kind of policy considerations that you want to make around privacy. But it's, again, cannot be seen as a silver bullet. You can't just buy AI and suddenly everything is secure right. and in private, right? right. You've, got to, you've got to pair this up with your business drivers right. and make sure that it aligns with what you're trying to accomplish. It's, it's not easy, but that's, I, that's where we've got to go with this. And I, I, yeah. I agree with you, Nathan. And I'll go a little bit different on the answer here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be future predicting if I can. You know, By all means. We all have, all have opinions. So my opinion on this one is, is very simple. I think there are the big guys who will go fight, um, go to the court, like Clearview is an example, IBM is an example, Google is an example. There are companies who have beat, dip, deep and big pockets, and they're going to go fight that privacy battle for a lot of data that they've collected through unfair or fair means. I think what these companies are going to do is going to, continue to commercialize these products that come with some inherent data. Now, you could challenge that data applies to AI or not, because for my organization, as Nathan said, my business drivers drive my AI. But what these companies are going to do is fight the battles and commercialize products for small companies to use who cannot afford the time and the luxury to buy ethical data. And then we will see new crops of businesses, new crops of data selling techniques emerge for companies to leapfrog the time it takes to build the AI intelligence. I think that's how um, uh, things are going to progress because, uh, let's face it, companies will not have the time or energy to build 
um, that intelligence on their own for their business drivers. Yeah, and, and if I may real quick, I mean, a small, medium yeah. market, business market, what may be most interesting about that point is we've seen over the last number of years a bit of a uh, resistance and, and, and a resurfacing this idea that we shouldn't be building our processes and our business around tools. The tools should be accommodating how we do our business. Uh, and I've watched this in the vendor market for a long time now with this, this change of like, buy our tool, we solve a problem to we'll be as flexible as you need, right? The, the message has changed over the years. But this may be, your, your point is spot on. And I think this may be the place where a lot of businesses make the, their own business decision to say, well, actually, I am going to give over to the tool and do it their way. Right. But I really don't have an option. I don't have the people. I don't have the money. I don't have the data sets. Ah, I'm, I'm just going to have to pick the right one and hope it's I'm the right one trust and hold into that process, right? Exactly. So it's going to be and fascinating to see machine, and kind you know, of revert back. And I think industry-specific data sets will be available for, for sale, for AI engines to learn. I, I do think that's a pattern and trend that's going to enable the companies to yeah. consume yeah. AI earlier than they can. Otherwise, we've got, we've got very slow adoption and very long road to smart AI. Mm-hmm. Agree. So you talked a little bit about smart AI, and we're we're ways from that. And uh, I would agree. I mean, obviously, that. Oh no! Maybe Nathan, you keep talking. <laughs> Just to entertain I, everybody else. I, I, I get. Yeah, I get, we can do, we can go for days. I, you know, I, I'll add about this very quickly because the data set thing. I mean, if, if anyone here watching or listening today does not think that this is where it's going to go. All of the big companies that deal in social media or, or data sets, Google, Apple, mm-hmm. Meta, Facebook, that announcement, mm-hmm. um, that's their, I mean, we all know that's their model. That's how that's they the make mindset. money is off of data. Yeah. So yeah. we've already built entire industries around monetizing data. Correct. The criminal actors have been building industries around monetizing data. So this is not, this shouldn't be a shock. Like they're going to find ways to monetize the data and, and if it's going to be kind of a commercialized good guy data set, of course we're going to do that because that's revenue. And they're going to that's do it. The only so, way to forward yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, well, Mark, we lost us and kept talking. Yeah, no, that's fine. And I, uh, like I said, I, I'm at the mercy of the technology here. But you're talking very much, uh, you know, the marketing world relies on data to to know who to target. And you know, now that uh, I used to talk talk to people who go to Facebook and they look at something on. Uh, Amazon that they'd be interested in and there'd be an ad for that product or something similar to that because there were some things that were noting their their practice and of course now we realized you know uh, it it knows me it knows the things I like to do Um, create some challenges for some folks but you're right exactly Um, I wanted to kind of get on a task uh, as we're here in the last few minutes uh, last few questions I think I know the, the, the short answer to this, but maybe you can elaborate on, do you imagine that there will be a future of AI being the sole defender of a system? Or will there always be a human element? And, you know, you know tell me why or why not? And Sandeep, we'll start with you. I, I think we've already covered that. I, I want to call it augmented intelligence. That's the new okay. AI word. That's real. That's practical. That's going to be adoptable by industries and businesses because let's just face it. AI is not mature enough, and I don't know if it'll ever be mature enough to be, um, like there's autonomous cars that still need humans behind the steering wheels. Mm -hmm. And so um, the short answer that I'm going to give is that we always need human beings sitting behind those machines to be able to go, okay, I'm going to, instead of focusing on 100,000 events, focus on these 25 events that AI is telling me are most impactful to my business. And so I'll just quickly say one thing, Nathan, and I'll let you... um, add to your commentary, but we look at two things, two drivers, intent and impact. What's the intent of this incident and what's the impact to the business? And I think when you look at it from that angle, um, my team only focuses on 20% of the big impact items that is going to make a difference to the business. The other 80% we let the machines handle. I, yeah, Nathan. I agree. I mean, we're, the humans aren't going anywhere, and, and it's because I mean, you can always build a better system, but it ultimately is a system. No matter how dynamic it might be, someone will try to figure out a way around it. 
And there's a contextual piece that I am not yet convinced anything in our lifetime is going to be able to pick up from a kind of a non-technical standpoint. And it's the context around that impact. Um, so thank you, Cindy, for leading me right into it. Um, you know, this is sometimes it's an easy thing for us to talk about impact when we stay inside our technical heads, right? If we talk about exploiting a vulnerability, we talk about getting access to a network, we talk about compromising data. These are all very technical things that we can almost gauge in a binary way. Either you did it or you didn't, right? But let's, I mean, we think about impact to a business. I mean, one of my favorite things, I'll try to do it very short here, but I worked for a, a massive, massive entertainment company years, years ago. Uh, they might be known to you. They have amusement parks and cruise lines and a whole movie studio and their own streaming network and happen to, you know, be very popular with animated films for children. Uh, nobody's a small, <laughs> small company. Um, but I talked to the CISO once about, the, you know, what are they trying to protect? What's their, their key thing? And, and he said to us, he said, do you know who we market to? And I was like, well, kids. And he's like, no, you, you have no idea. That's completely wrong. He says, the only thing we care about is protecting the safety of what we market to. And who we market to are today's children's children's children. Their target marketing wow. audience is three generations out because they're trying to build this idea of trust and family and that you just grow up with their products and they grow up with their movies so that today's kids are passing it along to their grandkids to keep this whole machine moving. So mm -hmm. he looked at me and said, if we get compromised, I don't really care. We'll pay the check. We'll pay the fine. We have money. Fine. We, system gets compromised. Yeah, just take it on there. I don't care. Mm -hmm. But something that violates that reputation, something that, that takes away a subjective kind of feeling that they're building as part of the, their business model, if something interferes with that, that is impact to them. That's when they start getting nervous. Programming, really advanced data sets, I mean, we could probably get close to understanding some of that. But this notion that smart AI is just going to figure that all out on its own and take over and protect that, there's no way. You're going to have to have people to deal with that subjective part of the business, to understand what really matters, understand the impact. And again, I love this augmented intelligence term. I'm stealing this, Cindy. Thank you. Um, that's the trick. We'll, we'll make it powerful, but you've got to have the people in there for the subjective kind of human elements of the, of the whole process. Uh, excellent, gentlemen. I'm going to give you guys uh, one last question for your final comments here. Um, and I would ask that you frame this around how would you recommend companies uh, out there implement their cybersecurity programs better using AI? Nathan, we'll go with you and then Sandeep. My number one recommendation about this is always do the, the boring, not sexy planning work up front. It is not a silver bullet. And like any platform, I don't care if it's SOAR or a SIM tool or anything that promises you it's going to save the day. You have to have a plan. You have to understand your business. You have to understand your workflows. You need to have a well-documented understanding of what you're trying to accomplish, where you're at, and what you want to do to get there. If you have that work done, then you can build and implement AI tools and products that will help you do it way, way, way better. But if you're going to jump into a situation, just buy something without a plan and you buy something in the hopes it's going to reveal the plan, I think you're going to struggle for years and not have really any kind of ROI, both from a financial standpoint or from a risk mitigation standpoint. You've got to do the hard work and have a plan going into this and understand what you need. Very good. Sandeep, same I'll question. Just, uh, I'll just, uh, you're absolutely right. I think the, the element I'm going to um, quickly talk about is that do not let go of your existing methodologies because AI is not going to replace any of them. It's not the silver bullet. So stick with your network segmentation, stick with your identity control, stick with your asset discovery, stick with your uh, VPNs and antiviruses, and then add um, augmented intelligence to data discovery and asset discovery and have the impact drive your decision. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for your time here on the panel. I know uh, we were running a little bit late, tried to catch up a few minutes of time there. So I'll turn it back over to you, Nathan. Yeah, thank, thank you. Rex. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Sandeep. I think it was a lovely, interesting panel discussion, the second panel discussion. And you all focused on a lot of things. Yeah, and last, I think, yeah, AI is not the solution. It is an enabler. It is a 
thing which can help you but yeah don't rely everything do your basics right i think that is the mantra uh, which you, you all give to the audience correct <laughs> so guys just to wrap up so uh, this is the last this was the last panel discussion this was the last talk for the day so we would like to thank all our technology partner that is digit 7 community partners speakers attendees who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum i think it was really interesting from all of you and i thoroughly enjoyed it to listen to all the thought leaders who are there in the space in cyber security uh, so guys please log on to our website and like the social media channels uh, we'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics details announcement of next events and much more which will help you to register and attend attend the same there are lots more in store for subsequent months as well with we'll focus on telecom that is next month there is a telecom event how ai is transforming the telecom sector then we on in december month we have like interesting topic that is marriage of ai iot and blockchain that is also a very interesting topic which we have in december then in january onwards we have ai in healthcare banking retail e-commerce and so on so request all of you to keep connection with us and enjoy the learning before closing the day i like to give all of you a thumbs up that today's event was broadcasted in youtube channel and the facebook channel of our company so like this thing and you will get the update of the uh, youtube link especially you can see the Uh, recording any time at your leisure and you can share it keep sharing keep sharing the knowledge keep sharing the things thank you guys have a lovely weekend ahead all of you thank you thanks everyone you too thanks nitin thanks sachin thanks, 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 thanks to everyone all the audience everyone who attended thanks